Magic vs. Cultivation by Jojo Kuen The longer you stare into the abyss, the deeper it stares right into your soul. In the aftermath of a world-changing disaster, with the last of his dying while Shoba is bound by a blood oath to a guardian, leading him on a perilous odyssey across vast worlds brimming with magic, mystic powers, demigods, goddesses, and eldritch horrors. With a cast of allies and adversaries emerging from the woodwork, Shoba delves into a labyrinth of mysteries, conspiracies, and a truth that could alter the course of his destiny. Chapter 1. The Warrior of Red. Other POV. Other POV. A lone iron figure stood motionless amidst a field of dying men. His crimson armor had just about survived the closing stages of a bloody battle, torn, ragged, and peeling away off his limbs like overboiled meat against dried bones. Most of his once prestigious iron armor had been stripped from his body, leaving boiled leather and fresh wounds seeping blood and exposed to the world. Behind his towering form, the fleeting embers of a bloody war smoldered into an empty calm. His gaze scanned across the vast land. This place was unrecognizable from how he first met it. Across a field of patchy grass, he saw fires consuming the decaying soils and had conjured a dreadful mist, one combined with the spray of carmine and melted flesh and bone. His body shuddered slightly because of it. From his point of view, the ground was almost shrouded in a smoky veil of death. Littered across the disheveled earth were bodies of course, countless bodies, those of his men, and those he had faced for the sake of his survival. And yet, just like all wars, once the calm appeared, enemies or friends, the dead were the dead all the same. He felt his skin crawl, returning to reality, the wails of dismembered men, too afraid to face death's door, filled the air. His gaze gently lowered, beneath his metallic feet, a pool of carmine gathered. The thick metal warmed beneath his gloved grasp was a long sword, half of its biting steel charred black from the dark blood of his enemies. He lifted his helmet away from his head, dark brown skin, matted with beads of sweat and flecks of the outdoors. His eyes remained discolored and bloodshot, barely open, yet they blazed with an unwavering light of resolve still within them. Though his wounds were deep, his soul was as sturdy as granite. He parted his full lips in a bid to speak. Instead, a stream of carmine dribbled down his beardless chin. The wounds from the battle had caught up to him, it seemed. His time was running out. With four arrows lodged into his back, and the countless sword bites marred against his arms, chest, and legs, the tiny hairs along his arms were caked red with his blood. It seems we've done enough, my trusted companion, his thoughts beckoned towards his long great sword. To the warrior in red, it was his most reliable friend. The warm breath of war blew through his torn frame. He lowered his eyelids, avoiding the rush of scorching dust carried along with the sweeping winds. Shortly after the dust settled, he pried open his heavy eyes once more and cast a solemn glare toward the high partially green hills in the far-off distance. Atop the distant peak stood seven figures, each clad in uniquely crafted attire. To any ordinary eye, they would be indistinguishable at such a distance, yet he saw them as clearly as if they were mere steps away. He knew them all personally by their given names, but that felt like such a breath of time ago. As of now, he saw them as the world saw them. The great powers, demigods woven from the fabric of a distasteful deity, the berserker, the hunter, the seer, the paladin, the assassin, the warlock, and the one he revered above all, the priestess. A wry smirk spread across his full lips. He snorted the blood back from his nostrils and spat a hoarse, blood-filled phlegm onto the ground. Narrowing his eyes, he endeavored to know the expressions on the faces of the seven figures in the distance. Were they filled with indignation? Sorrow? Fear? Anguish? Hatred? Love? Respect? Their distant eyes each told a unique story of their own. Yet a common thread had long since woven through the hearts of all. They yearned for his death today. He harbored no fear towards their alliance, of course. This was the time of war and their allegiance was to their king. Though his forces lay vanquished, the ground littered with the last remnants of his siege. His blade had claimed the lives of many. And yet, 
it was far from enough to change anything he quickly realized. As he contemplated his life, his only lament was his failure to produce heirs. Drawing a deep breath, pain jabbed at his wounded chest, signaling the dire state of his internal organs. But he would not be misled by the physical pain, for fear was the mind killer, just as his old master had told him long before. Grasping the pommel of his great sword again, he threw his head back and unleashed a ferocious roar into the skies. Hear me now, O ye great false gods of fate. Look at me now, an abandoned son, forged from the deaths of thousands, the madness you poured into our lands. Hear me, see me, I have become the mightiest. See how your disciples gang up against me, me, a toad you toss to the bottom of the well. I am content to die. For I have shown the world just how feeble your powers are, Bwahaha, I trample on your false grace. His roar echoed across the hills, halting the wind. All seemed to fall silent, as if the world itself was an audience to the last great roar of the lone warrior, defiant against the powers of fate until the very end. His breath grew ragged, chest heaving in desperate gasps. The force of his cry had drained the vestiges of his strength, leaving him spent. Blood gathered in his chest, his lungs compromised, yet such concerns were trivial to him now. A cold, formless wind passed through the field of war once more. The lonesome warrior lowered his eyelids. Inwardly he thanked the gods for this last enrichment of soothing wind. When he finally lifted his eyelids, the figures atop the hill stirred into motion. Six shadows surged forward, leaving one, the priestess, standing alone. Her attire was of an ethereal white, purer than the untouched snow. Her movements delicate, reminiscent of a musician's grace upon a zither, as she slowly raised her slender arm. A white veil concealed her visage, adorned with a golden chain upon her brow. She seemed to be preparing whilst the shadows converged upon the battlefield. His eyes remained fixed on the solitary figure of the priestess. Her hands wove intricate patterns in the empty air conjuring a golden scepter that materialized in her grasp. With a celestial motion, she lifted it high, calling forth a radiant orb of golden fire. What first appeared as a tiny speck of fire, very radiantly swelled into a comet, as formidable as a mountain's crown. He grit down against his teeth harshly. Does she need to go that far? He grimaced sardonically, grasping his sword, the warrior prepared for the final confrontation. The approaching six were but a fleeting challenge compared to the celestial firestorm summoned by the priestess. By now the six figures had almost arrived upon him. Even if he repelled them off, there was no avoiding that ball of fire. With a deep sigh, he sucked in a large mouthful of air and exhaled. His body felt as calm as the steel in his hands. With narrowed eyes, his arms squeezed the handle of his sword and a baleful aura spilled into the thick, great sword. A purple liquid swiftly covered the blade as well as his arm which handled it. He counted six breaths before they were upon him. His body could barely move as he willed it too at this point. A look of gladness appeared within his eyes, and with shaking arms, the lonesome warrior raised his great sword high and mightily. And then he cut down, for one final time. Since when? Did the azure sky look so beautiful? Whilst darkness encroached his gaze from all angles, in his final breaths he saw something strange. A falling dust of gold, slowly falling, like divine drops of rain upon him. Strange it seemed, but then he heard a voice, a watery choral speech, softly calling for him in the dense fog of darkness. Fear not, my champion, for your song is far from complete. Let thy heart rest knowing this, that I, the goddess of dawn and gold, have chosen you to bear my will. Come, place your heart upon my lap. It's time for your awakening. First Death, The Warrior of Red. Chapter 2, The Blue Scientist, Other POV. The atmosphere was heavy with a mixture of dampness and an array of chemical odors polluting the air. Warning signs with radioactive symbols decorated along the expansive walls, underscoring the perilous nature of the surroundings. The walls were lined with protective white foam padding, engineered to resist the corrosive and toxic agents that were often unleashed within the confines of this metallic chamber. At the heart of the room, 
two figures in light-colored hazmat gear stood opposite each other across a gleaming, well-polished silver table. The table hosted an array of test tubes, each housing a misshapen ivory bone submerged in a bubbling neon green solution. Yet, their attention was captivated by an enigmatic cube resting on a diminutive silver tray. The cube itself, sat encased in a shimmering gold exterior, secured with silver prongs from an apparatus holding it sturdily in place. Lodged in its center was a radiant sapphire stone. Its polished facets caught the light and shone majestically, further enunciating the cube's immense worth. With a mutual nod, the pair acknowledged their shared intent. The shorter of the two reached towards a transparent case beside the table, its contents a collection of syringes, petri dishes, and metallic instruments. Simultaneously, the taller individual positioned another cylindrical container on the table, adjacent to the cube. A soft press of a button on its side coaxed the lid open. Inside a golden, fong-shaped piece of metal nestled within. This piece shimmered ominously, humming softly as it met the air. Employing the tongs, the shorter colleague aligned this golden fragment with a corresponding slot on the cube. Both researchers retreated a step, bracing for a reaction. Yet, as time ticked by, their anticipation waned into disappointment. The cube remained unchanged. A brief silence ensued before relief washed through their heavy suits. Noticeably, their stiff postures eased into a more relaxing stance. Leaving the containment zone, the taller figure punched a bright red button near the exit, initiating a shower of cleansing gas into the corridor connecting to the main lab. After the purifying gas had filled the narrow hallway, the hiss of the gas ceased, and the red lights above the door blinked a few times before turning green, signaling the air was safe. They both removed their hazmat helmets. The shorter one revealed herself to be a beautiful young woman with a warm brown complexion and almond-shaped eyes, her face sprinkled with darker freckles, her hair was styled into an elegant braid. She looked inquisitively at her colleague, who was slower in removing his protective gear. As his helmet came off, he presented a stark contrast to the girl called Haley, a man with piercing blue eyes set in a gaunt and slightly thin face, his skin a pallid tone, and he carried stringy blonde hair meticulously styled into slightly lazy but neatly coiffed hairstyle. Haley observed the vacant expression in his eyes as they transitioned into the next room. Why the long face, Jeffers? You should be a little happy since today concludes our experimentation on Object T3, RR0-0, R01. She stretched her arms out whilst exhaling a deep yawn. We can finally breathe and wash our hands with this relic once and for all. Oh, I need a drink after all this trouble. All the fuss over some damn relic. Sigh. Say how's Melanie doing these days? Jeffers paused once that name was mentioned, and then his tiresome gaze fell upon the shorter girl beside him. Melanie? It's, it's been quite some time, Jeffers murmured, his expression somber as memories of a golden-haired woman he had once known surfaced in his mind. Hmm, you don't talk anymore? Haley expressed her disapproval with a gentle shake of her head her fingers briefly massaging the space between her eyebrows before she let out another deep sigh. Sigh. Jeffers, this isn't good for you, she finally said, observing the stoic look across Jeffers' face for a moment. Good for me? Jeffers seemed puzzled by her remark. Yes, good for you. I'm talking about relationships, Jeffers. The kind of thing normal people engage in. Goodness, Jeffers, there's an entire world out there beyond these lab walls, you know? Haley couldn't help but glance around at the extensive network of laboratory halls as they walked along what felt like a never-ending corridor. The offices were deserted, the day's work haven drawn to a close for the day, leaving behind a serene ambience that enveloped the silver and white corridors. Don't you ever think about those stories? Those workaholics who pass away before experiencing life? Buried under their work only to succumb to some relentless illness without warning one day? Haley's words echoed through the empty halls, stirring a contemplative silence between the two. Jeffers let out a soft sigh of his own, his mind momentarily drifting to the security of the artifact they had just secured. Speaking in a low tone, he replied, spending your free time reading random articles is one of the worst things someone hailed as possessing one of the greatest minds in the country should be doing. Say, 
Did you recall whether or not I tested the iodine liquid levels from item T3? Haley's brows quickly knitted. She was expecting this pushback from him. Having spent enough time beside this shrewd fellow over the years, how could she not understand the sort of person she was dealing with? Forget about all of that for one moment. Tell me about Mel. I thought for once you had found someone. Right for you? Her voice trailed off into a downcast whisper. Jeffers could only awkwardly steal a glance a few times. He felt the mood had soured between them suddenly, and due to his social awkwardness, he wasn't sure just how to make it better. I aya him about item T3. He tried to say, but Haley didn't respond and continued wearing a dispirited face whilst they both walked along the corridor, now in silence. Jeffers being immune to the notion of empathy towards the feelings of others could only use his deep interest in this project to lighten the mood. I read from a classified dossier we had requested from the Euro branch concerning their findings about the glyphs carved on its rich metals. Jeffers rambled on, uncaring whether or not his colleague desired to chime in. He was a man who spent most of his leisure time buried knee-deep in working with complex statistical formulas and trying his best to refute the basic findings of other clever minds in the field of ancient artifacts. I think we should barter for access to the alien genetics team's studies into artifacts from the fourth epoch. They finally arrived at a flight of white stairs, climbing towards more white rooms with expensive and delicate equipment inside. Jeffers finally noticed Haley, hadn't said anything in the last 15 minutes. Is there something wrong? He inquired slightly timidly. Haley tossed a glare towards him, before exhaling a deep sigh and softening her eyes. Whilst turning away, she massaged the bridge of her nose staring off into one of the empty open offices lost in a daydream. T3? She uttered beneath her voice in defeat. I'm still skeptical but I do also believe it may unveil some important unanswered questions about the beings of that epoch. The consensus amongst the White Hill historians is that the folk who built these artifacts were not exactly human. Jeffers chimed in. He already studied all the materials about the other folk who lived through the famed fourth epoch. Two very important events occurred during this time. The dimensional rift implosion was one. The second was the New Age world governments assembled into a coalition that aimed to traverse and understand the phenomenon. Through these pivotal moments in history, a history-defining truth appeared, and that was that evidence suggested there were thousands of uniquely existing worlds, like dotted ants across an endless cosmic dune. Professor Oskold, too, coined the term colliding galaxies to summarize what the people who lived during the fourth epoch called the end of the world. Human was a loose term during that period, but I guess before the event coined as Starfall, you could call most of them humans. Also, we need to make sure we have the full report done before the head of the Union branch arrives in a few days. Haley wore an expression as though even she had just remembered that annoyingly enough, it seemed her dreams of peace were premature. By now, the pair had reached the other side of the long hall, lined with open offices. At the end of a silent, Narrow corridor with tall white walls, a large elevator, twice the size of a double door, awaited them. Jeffers walked casually along, lost in his thoughts, wearing a shrewd smile as he pondered on new experiments, while Haley, admiring the golden framed murals lining the walls, removed her gloves to activate the elevator's handprint sensor placed to the side to call the elevator. The murals displayed the still faces of deceased scientists and famous figures who once roamed these very corridors. There's no telling what kind of power these artifacts wield. The radiation charge alone showed frightening numbers. I wonder, if we could attach it to an ion regulator, Jeffers mused. Haley, deep in thought, debated whether to share a crucial discovery with her cold-faced colleague. A sudden idea brought a pretty smile to her face. Jeffers. I care about you a lot, you know? So, I want you to do something for me. Before I tell you this, I need you to promise to obey my one request, she said, her almond-shaped eyes holding a willful glare. Jeffers, placing his curious gray eyes on her for the first time in a while, replied, I'm listening. As long as it's within the boundaries of decency. Give Mel a second chance, she implored. Jeffers felt a deep annoyance crawl up his neck, but remained silent. Instead, he studied Haley's demeanor. He was bewildered by the importance people placed on benign things such as relationships. 
If it weren't for the higher-up's orders to socialize for at least three hours a week, he would pay no mind to these matters. Haley hesitated the weight of her thoughts, noticeably pressing down on her. What I have to tell you. It's about T3. The analysis, the glyphs, they're eerily similar to the ones found around the Algamira sinkhole. There's more to this than just ancient history. I fear we might be meddling with forces we don't fully understand. Jeffer's interest was piqued, his previous distraction fading as he tuned in to Haley's concern. Similar? How conclusive are the findings? Almost identical, Haley admitted with a sigh. I cross-referenced the glyphs with the database, and the match is uncanny. This isn't just a relic, Jeffers. It might be a key to a new world, or a warning. Chapter 3. The Blue Scientist, 2. Exiting the building, they were greeted by the dark street, lit by golden street lamps and a rain-slicked floor. Haley, still affected something, flatly offered Jeffers a ride, but he declined suggesting they catch up the next day. Despite his very real social awkwardness, he could tell she was in no mood to hang around him. Alone, Jeffers considered a walk through the serene night, but was quickly deterred by the sudden quake against the dark heavens. His gaze trailed towards the expanse of velveteen darkness settled above. Agonizing seconds later, a torrent of rain started to fall. Forced back into the foyer, he glanced around pondering whether it was ethical or even safe enough to venture back into the testing labs on his own. No one will know, besides I only wanted to make sure I had safely locked everything back into its keep. After the very brief mental tussle with right and wrong, he decided to revisit the lab and the mysterious artifact, T3, for reassurance. He stealthily checked to ensure Haley had left before briskly making his way to the inner lab again. Jeffers eventually managed to squeeze himself into the silvery hazmat suit. Using his gloved hands, he securely fastened the respirators over his face. Walking towards the closed metallic door, the green LED cast a lime shadow over the keypad. He punched in the seven-digit code. Beep, beep. The light turned golden, and the metal doors parted aside. There was something oddly soothing about this place. Jeffers felt most like his true self here even on the days when his only task was to keep the apparatus clean. These four white padded walls provided a seclusion of peace he couldn't find anywhere in the outside world. Pondering this, Jeffers understood why the few people he knew expressed concern about him. I can't be oblivious to their concerns, especially considering the suicide rates in this profession, he thought. But he also couldn't deny himself the things that intrigued him, like the ancient, alien-like artifact, T3. From the first day he received the optics detailing the artifact's history, he was drawn to it like a moth was to a flame. Jeffers brought out the tightly sealed silver and black case and gently laid it on one of the many squared work tables. The spotless metal was so smooth, so smooth that he could see his hazmat suit's reflection against it. He wanted to take this chance to review some of the hypotheses he had regarding the levels of energy emitted by the cube under certain conditions. So Jeffers walked towards a closed cabinet and delicately opened one side of its two doors. For shells were fixed inside and on the top shelf was a class of Jared liquids with labels against them. The second and third shelves housed small boxes secured in larger metal boxes with the latches closed using a sturdy black padlock. Jeffers scanned the shelves until his eyes widened upon seeing the purpose of his arrival here. He gently bent his knees and clasped his gloved hands against a steel box. Its weight was heavy, so he staggered a little whilst he carefully carried it to the same table he placed T3 on. Jeffers first freed an apparatus from the steel box, resembling a compact version of a radiation machine. He then cautiously pried the sealed T3 cube from its protective casing. Beneath the artificial white lights, the golden metals of the cube shone majestically. Inside the golden casing, the profound blue orb glowed vibrantly, reminiscent of deep blue waters trapped within a firmament. For a few minutes, Jeffers could only marvel at it in silence, admiring its otherworldly beauty. He carefully lifted the cube by its golden edges and placed it onto the round base of the apparatus. An unseen magnetic force held the cube in place. After taking a step back and breathing a sigh of relief, Jeffers began clasping the metal bolts to stabilize the cube's movements during the next process. He then positioned two flexible metal arms around the cube, 
each arm ending in pincers that held onto a side of the cube. Once secured, and the apparatus set in place, he lightly tapped the oval hood on top, activating a blue LED that flickered before turning bright green, indicating the experiment was underway. Turning his attention to the neatly arranged stack of files on the other side of the room, Jeffers approached a long table against the wall. Inside a protective see-through box, he sifted through the files. The T3 experiment had produced over 30 different case files, an unprecedented number for an ancient relic that had been looked over by over 10 different scientific minds. But Jeffers found it necessary for the researchers dedicated to unraveling the mysteries of its complex existence. Jeffers, who felt a deep connection to the relic, believed the secrets of the cube lay in its golden case which emitted high magnetic energy waves. He considered the blue crystal inside to be only part of its deeper truth. Returning to the files, he examined a diagram of the golden case, etched with runes from an ancient language thousands of years old. One of the many researchers had made a startling hypothesis about said runes. After cross-referencing a very old language, recovered in the Dead Sea thousands of years ago, the researcher managed to coin a similar pattern with the runes against the relic with that of this particular dead language. And shockingly made a discovery, one word appeared which he managed to rather accurately discern. The fisherman? Jeffers spoke, reminded of the strange, words supposedly written within the rune translated by that scientist. Let me start the separation process, he muttered, placing the pages back into the files and neatly stacking them. Suddenly, a strange sensation crept up his spine. The air turned eerily still as though a cold chill walked into the area. He spun around in alarm and was stunned by what greeted his sight. A blinding pale light violently emitting from the violently shaking cube, accompanied by a screeching sound and the rattling of the silver table. Rooted in the spot between elation and fear, Jeffers felt compelled to move closer. Despite the risk, he felt a mixture of emotions pulling him closer to the cube. The light intensified and then, boom, an explosion akin to a small missile erupted, engulfing everything within the high-class protective laboratory. Amid Jeffers' sudden realization that his life had succumbed to an unfortunate end, he saw something within the blinding haze of white. A strange figure? An ethereal being with two large white wings unfolded into the air. Two large ivory horns protruded away from the helm, and although the light was by far too bright to make out clear definitions of this being, Jeffers couldn't miss the blood-soaked crimson eyes beholding him. Within those final moments, he was assured he saw the figure smile. The Second Death Blue Scientist Chapter 4 Gunslinger with Purple Shells The halls stood eerily silent. With each shallow breath, the gravely injured man who had crouched behind a fallen desk, with his back firmly pressed against it, felt a steady stream of blood seeping from his wounds. His bloodshot eyes darted nervously to the four bullet holes in his left thigh, each wound raw and exposed, resembling meat flayed and hung on a butcher's hook. A cold grimace crossed his face as he acknowledged the end of his luck. The distant sound of footsteps drew his focus. A pair of rugged boots moved swiftly across the floor, their zigzagging path marked by a trail of crimson footprints leading ominously toward his makeshift refuge. He closed his eyes, taking measured breaths, using the sounds around him to visualize the scene unfolding beyond his closed lids. He heard the menacing glow of two thick red lasers emanating from a two-and-a-half-inch infrared scope, the assured grip on semi-automatic machine guns, fingers lightly resting on triggers, and the pulsating rhythm of two warm, blood-filled hearts. His sweaty right hand found the cool metal of the gun beside him, a silver revolver with a nozzle blackened by use. He pressed the revolver against his temple, counted to fifteen, and as the footsteps neared, he pivoted swiftly, rising with the lethal grace of a serpent. His arms extended, fingers tightening on the trigger, his aim unerring. Two shots rang out, but he was a fraction too slow. The first bullet skimmed his chin. The second burrowed a brutal path just below his left shoulder. The pain was a stark, searing shock, yet his thoughts remained razor sharp. Not like this, not yet. With a heart-pounding defiance, he adjusted his aim and discharged three rounds of his own. Each bullet seemed to carry destiny's touch, 
finding its mark between the eyes of his assailants. The third bullet gruesomely disfigured one's mouth in its ricochet. The stunned expressions etched on their faces were the last to fade as they crumpled to the ground. Exhaling in relief, he gauged this to be the last of the threats on this floor. His steps carried him forward, but his heart was heavy with grief. His eyes taking in the fallen comrades that lined his path brought a subtle rare moment of reflection for him. The mission was a catastrophic failure. His squad had been decimated. The weight of being the sole survivor pressed down on him, mingling with the bitter realization that the cost of this endeavor was far too great. Ascending a flight of stairs towards a closed door bathed in crimson, his bloodied footsteps stained each step. With a determined shove of his shoulder, he burst through the double doors into a room that contrasted sharply with the carnage outside. The suite was adorned with polished black and white tiles, a grand mahogany table at its heart, and desks decorated with golden figures of fierce creatures. Tall windows set against the walls were draped with heavy, opulent red curtains. The air remained thick with the scent of luxury. In the backdrop of faintly playing jazz music, his attention was drawn to a half-open box on the table. With each step towards it, he felt as though he was inching closer to his end, his wounds relentlessly bleeding profusely. Peering inside the box contained a collection of sealed files, a dozen or so, but it was the sight of these very peculiar ominous black crystals, each about eight inches long, that caused a flicker in his gaze. Compelled by curiosity, he reached out and caressed the sleek surface of one of the crystals. Suddenly, a malevolent energy surged through his arm, accompanied by a howling voice that resonated in the depths of his mind. To my beloved son Nocturne, it is with profound grace that I extend my benediction to you. In the luminous gaze of my eyes, I bestow upon you a ceaseless veneration amidst the enigmatic veils of the nocturnal realm. May your subsequent melody eclipse the beauty of its predecessor. Resounding with an elegance that surpasses all prior harmonies, I absolve you of the burdens our world has unjustly laid upon your shoulders. My dearest child, harbor not the weight of past transgressions, but stand resolute in the unwavering faith of the days that lie ahead, a future replete with redemption and hope. I love you dearly, my beautiful boy. A heavy fog surrounded his thoughts, his body felt weak whilst his vision slowly regained its focus. He felt his senses return to reality. But then, for their sake, you must return to the void. A dark voice spoke behind him. He stiffened, feeling blood on his lips whilst a stainless katana protruded through his chest. Nina, he whispered, recognizing the voice of his lifelong companion. The katana pushed further, and her words began to distantly reach his already fading consciousness. I'm Esosore. In the cold darkness, he saw the dark crystal's mysterious aura. At death's door, he wondered if his life made any sense, if the rivers of his enemy's blood had finally quenched his thirst for revenge. The distant faces of his family haunted him, and in his final moments, he inwardly pleaded for salvation. S. Someone, SSA save, MM. His form crumpled to the chill floor, darkness encroaching on the edges of his vision. Yet, Amidst the relentless advance of oblivion, a curious spectacle emerged, a gentle golden-white radiance piercing the murk of his waning consciousness. A pair of immaculate white feet gracefully neared his prone figure, enveloped in a celestial shimmer of golden granules. He yearned to behold more, but his sight swiftly dissolved into the void. The Third Death, Gunslinger Chapter 5, The Drifter and the Fool Other POV H. How far is it? came a voice, muffled under a dark shrouded hood, slightly misunderstood amidst the relentless rain pouring down on the bitterly cold night. Huh, what did you say? The other, more burly figure leading the way, inquired. They were two hooded figures, hastening through the narrow, dimly lit, cobbled streets. Streetlights stood like dark sentinels, their tops crowned with orbs of golden light, partially shedding away the darkness of the dark street. At this late hour, the area was conspicuously deserted, adding an extra layer of eeriness to the dark, rain-drenched town. Concerning the two shrouded fellows in the night, they could be seen still weaving between the hard-standing poles, 
now and again dwindling their sights toward the gloomy twilight skies above them. The younger fellow especially seemed lost in the dreamlike expanse of nightingale above, where a myriad of stars stitched against the skies. Observant yet somber eyes scanned the closely packed houses they passed, with no time real time spared to admire or even glance at the surroundings of the quaint, Victorian-style city. Their lengthy travels had placed them in a solitary fortress nestled beneath the imposing mountains of Savage, a region known very well as the dark heart of the southern realms. Here, mountains with grotesque visages loomed over the landscape like ominous guardians, with dust clouds of pollution and grim tethered to the heavens. And where man was considered a beast, and the beasts were perhaps all extinct and eaten, this was the city of Santana. The more robust of the two, driven by urgency, had not paused for rest since their journey commenced two weeks prior. Despite maintaining a brisk pace, signs of fatigue were evident. He was panting heavily. His companion, more agile and observant, could both hear the weariness in his breath and see the exhaustion etched on his face. Lorne, shouldn't we take a break, maybe? The boy asked, his voice tinged with concern. His query was met with a stern glare from the disheveled, gruff-haired man, whose bulky frame suggested a life of hard labor. No need. We press on. Remember, purple reeds and a goat's tail. That's our marker, replied Lorne, his voice hoarser than before and noticeably weaker. Sensing the finality in his tone, the boy chose not to press the issue. Experience had taught him that the harsh contact of a rugged boot against his shins, or worse, his backside, was a lesson best not repeated. The duo navigated the silent city with little disturbance, their passage facilitated by the relentless downpour that seemed to have cleared the streets of its usual inhabitants. Soaked through by the torrential rain, Lorne and his youthful companion made no complaints. The path before them delved deeper into the city's core, and Lorne was acutely aware of the risk of encountering the night patrol should they venture onto the central boardwalk. At this juncture, Lorne's strategy hinged on the inclement weather masking their movements, coupled with a reliance on the whims of fortune. The boy, with youthful curiosity evident in his demeanor, couldn't help but let his gaze wander. To him, the rain transformed the cityscape into something ethereal. The gray cobbled streets, bathed in rain and chilled by the cold, shimmered with an otherworldly glow, reminiscent of frosted glass, casting the mundane in a magical light. As they navigated the labyrinthine streets, their path was often diverted by sharp turns leading into shadowy alleyways or deserted service roads, littered with the husks of old vehicles stripped bare of engines and aesthetics. The city had shuttered for the night. Bakeries, the bank, and the various general stores had all turned their signs to closed, leaving the streets in a state of quiet desolation. They moved along a street marked Taver's Town. The boy's inquisitive gaze landed on a shop to his left. Its windows were boarded up, and an eerie squeak emanated from the sign that dangled on a rusty chain above the entrance, swaying in the night breeze. An animal's tail and a green reed adorned the sign. Lorne, Lorne, I think I've found it. Come here, look. It's the reed and, uh, pig's tail? The boy exclaimed, his excitement palpable yet slightly misdirected. It's a goat's tail, you fool. But yes, this appears to be the place, Lorne corrected with a mix of irritation and slight weariness whilst he took in the boarded store. His brows furrowed, his lips trembling slightly as he surveyed the sign. A visible unease settled over him as he contemplated the impending meeting, the weight of their mission finally pressing heavily upon him. Lorne's gaze softened as it settled on the young man beside him. It had been a while since he truly observed the boy who had grown so much under his tutelage. The boy's unkempt, fiery reddish-brown hair and bright blue eyes stood out against his sallow skin, his youthful features accentuated by perfectly shaped Cupid's bow lips. The boy was still young, but he had matured significantly since their paths first crossed. Despite how he spoke to him, Lorne was glad the little lad was around. Do not speak even if spoken to. Do not look him in the eye. Do not touch him, and lastly, if at any moment you begin to hear things but do not see them, tap me on my shoulders three times. Be but that doesn't make any sense. The boy stammered, confusion evident across his arched brow. Shut up and listen. You don't need to understand, 
but you will follow these instructions, by God, Lorne snapped, his tone leaving no room for debate. Sensing the unease within his young charge, Lorne delved into his heavy, rain-soaked coat and retrieved a slim, silver-coated necklace. The pendant, composed of four tiny silver petals, cradled a pale pinkish jewel at its center. Wear this around your neck, but keep it concealed. Should anything go awry, squeeze the jewel and pray to your god, Lorne instructed. The boy's mouth opened to question, but Lorne's firm, bearish hand silenced any forthcoming objections. Thumb it, pull it, do whatever it takes to keep it in your grasp. Understand this, boy. The people we're dealing with are not like us. They're dangerous. Very dangerous. Never forget that. Guided by Lorne, they navigated through the narrow alleyway wedged between the boarded-up shop and the neighboring house, arriving at a beige door made heavy with rainwater. With a firm pull on the iron handle, Lorne opened the door, its hinges protesting with a loud squeal that seemed to echo through their body. Stepping inside, they found themselves in a hollow corridor, its walls adorned with piping and decorated in an ancient style that spoke of the city's long history. The dim lighting barely pierced the darkness, and the silence was occasionally broken by the sound of raindrops infiltrating from the outside. Ahead lay another barrier, a steel door behind which a faint melody could be discerned, adding a surreal gloom to the already tense atmosphere. Lorne paused, taking a moment to steady himself with a deep breath before pushing the door open. They emerged into a larger, dimly lit space, its industrial aesthetic accentuated by oversized pipes and sections encased in cages. The floor beneath their feet was slick with the overflow from the sewers. The younger boy found the mucky floor disheartening, trying his best not to get his boots soaked in the mess. Surprisingly, the ground had sloped downwards without their notice, and Lorne realized they were now beneath the very heart of the citadel. In the center of this underground chamber stood a hooded figure, an island of calm surrounding this shroud. Beside this enigmatic presence was a simple brown chair, from which the soft strains of jazz music emanated from a radio. As Lorne and the boy entered, their footsteps echoed against the hard surface, announcing their presence. The hooded figure, sensing their arrival, slowly turned to face them, the movement deliberate and measured. Ah, you finally arrived, my friend? And you're not alone, H.M.? Hello, new friend. You can call me Mr. Pax. My full name is a bit of a tongue twister bwahaha. The figure greeted them with a cordial bow. Lorne moved forward with caution, his eyes scanning the man who seemed unexpectedly young to be shrouded in such mystery. As Mr. Pax emerged from the shadows, his features became more discernible. A pair of cupid bow lips set against his round, olive-skinned face, with youthful grayish-green eyes that sparkled with an untamed curiosity. Mr. Pax removed his glove and reached out, his hand extended in a gesture towards the young boy. The peculiar twinkle in his eyes did not sit well with Lorne, prompting him to quickly position himself protectively between Mr. Pax and the boy. This here is my assistant. He's not much for conversation, especially with those he doesn't know. Can we get down to business now? Lorne interjected coldly. Ah, uh, yes, business business is indeed crucial. I imagine it must be quite the struggle for hard-working individuals like yourselves to make ends meet in such challenging times. I've heard unsettling rumors of children being born with deformities in this area, which isn't surprising given the vile smog that blankets our skies. If it were up to me, I'd raise those factories to the ground, haha. <laughs> Do you think the world would be grateful for such a deed, my old friend? Mr. Pax chuckled softly. The factories may be a blight, but they offer employment, and employment provides us with the coin we need to survive, Lorne countered pragmatically, reaching into his pocket to retrieve a pouch secured with a black ribbon. He tossed the bag, heavy with silver coins, towards Mr. Pax. People here have grown indifferent to the pollution. Their immediate concern is putting food on the table. Now, let's see the item so I can be on my way, Lorne demanded impatiently. Despite Lorne's stern demeanor, Mr. Pax maintained his cheerful disposition, revealing a wooden box secured by a golden lock. He passed the box to Lorne, who quickly opened it to reveal its contents. Inside lay a glittering black crystal that captivated Lorne instantly. There was an eerie, profound quality to the jewel, 
it emitted a sinister, whispering sound that seemed to resonate with something deep within him. Swiftly, Lorne snapped the box shut and stowed it away in his pocket, a subtle, knowing smile creeping across his weathered face. Lorne knew just how valuable this jewel was, and with it, his life as a common peasant was due to be a thing of the past. Ah, come now, having provided you with such a rare and potent artifact at a bargain, surely you can satisfy a bit of my curiosity. Mr. Pax pressed, his demeanor still light but with an underlying intensity. Lorne's expression hardened. He was wary of saying too much to this fellow. What is it you wish to know? He asked cautiously. Let's start with something simple. You and your companion don't strike me as mere merchants, so perhaps drifters or something more exotic. The life of a wanderer has always held a certain allure for me. Freedom from constraints, a life dictated by one's own choices. It's quite admirable, really. And your name was? Mr. Pax trailed off, as if expecting Lorne to fill in the blanks. Lorne maintained his guarded stance, his eyes narrowing slightly as he regarded Mr. Pax. The young man's smile seemed almost too fixed, too deliberate, and it did nothing to ease Lorne's growing suspicion. Our names weren't part of the deal. We're traders, but not in the common sense. We specialize in acquiring items that are out of the ordinary, much like the crystal you've just sold us. Lorne replied his tone firm, making it clear that personal details were not on the table for discussion. The exchange had revealed little, but confirmed much about the nature of their meeting. Lorne was ready to leave, the crystal secured and their business concluded, yet he remained alert, aware that in dealings such as these, the end was rarely as straightforward as it seemed. Lorne's seasoned gaze shifted towards the boy at his side, whose evident unease was a stark contrast to his own. The boy's eyes darted nervously, reacting to every sound in the dimly lit room, his pale face and chapped lips betraying his inner turmoil. It was clear to Lorne that the boy's resilience was waning under the strain of their precarious position. Regaining his composure, Lorne turned back to face Mr. Pax, his expression one of measured calm. In this life, men like us assume many roles. In my time, a man was expected to master a multitude of skills, from navigating the high seas and preparing a feast, to engaging in battle and cherishing his family. And yes, even the dark art of taking a life. Today's youth seem to view the world through a narrower lens. Perhaps one day, you'll appreciate the broader perspective that comes with age, Lorne said, his voice tinged with a mix of nostalgia and reproof, a rare smile briefly exposing his worn teeth. Mr. Pax's previously unshakable demeanor seemed to waver at Lorne's words slightly, his smile momentarily losing its permanence. Ah, you believe so? It seems to me that it's the elders who are often set in their ways. Was it not the decisions of past lords and kings that condemned the children of this land to labor in factories and mines, or imposed crippling taxes on a populace already struggling to survive? I must admit, you're quite the unique character, sir. Perhaps we could forge an unlikely alliance. You and I. Imagine the tales they tell of our partnership. Mr. Pax mused the corners of his mouth slightly lifting. Lorne, momentarily taken aback by Mr. Pax's words, weighed his next move carefully. In a world where survival often hinged on the ability to discern truth from deception, Lorne had honed his instincts to navigate through the most perilous situations. Recognizing the paramount importance of self-preservation, he shifted the conversation toward a potential opportunity. Say, how many more crystals could you procure for me? Lorne inquired, his tone noticeably softer. Mr. Pax's demeanor momentarily faltered before he resumed his characteristic, buoyant facade. Acquiring them in large quantities might take some time. However, I do have a few more on hand. The price, though, will be doubled, he replied, his face alight with a mix of anticipation and slight cunning. Lorne's expression hardened at the mention of the price hike. How many can you provide me with today? He pressed. After a moment of contemplation, Mr. Pax's face lit up with a sudden realization. I can secure a few more for you now, but I'll need you to wait here. It would be imprudent to carry all my wares with me, he stated, the sly grin returning to his youthful face. Lorne, sensing an opportunity, subtly gestured for the boy to come closer. With a swift movement, he reached into the boy's robes, 
retrieved the coin purse hidden within, and whispered a quick directive. Mr. Pax, focused on the prospect of the forthcoming transaction, seemed oblivious to the exchange between Lorne and the boy. Lorne tossed the bag filled with coin at the hooded figure, whose face lit up with stars at the weight of it underneath his grasp. As Mr. Pax turned to leave, promising to return shortly with the additional crystals, a sudden, unexpected sound halted him in his tracks, a metallic click that pierced the heavy silence of the room. Huh. Puzzled, Mr. Pax turned around, only to find himself staring down the barrel of a black iron revolver. The wielder was of course Lorne, who gripped the pistol with a look of conviction burned into his two eyes. A few breaths later, Lorne pulled the trigger and sent the bullet blasting into the left side of the fellow's face. The force sent the hooded fellow crumbling backward as he slid against the ground before lying in a heap. The bullet had eaten away any piece of flesh and bone it met. The burning smoke wheezed out from the combustion of the shot. Lorne stood still for a few patient moments. His heart was racing, his breath laborious, but with the clearing of the smoke, seeing the lifeless body of the hooded wearer brought a satisfying smile. The boy beside him, however, could barely make sense of what had just occurred. There was a ringing noise distorting the world around him. All he could do was shield his ears whilst watching the blurry figure of Lorne approaching the dead body. Why, 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 oh, you shot him? Wh, why did you do that? He muttered brokenly. Lorne ignored him at first. He was too busy searching the corpse for anything valuable. He didn't find anything shaped like a box or anything much for that matter. Lorne decided to check the apparel. He fought through layers of clothes before he noticed something peculiar poking out of the trouser pockets. Lorne carefully took out the stick-like object with his two stubby fingers and his greedy eyes almost fell out of their sockets. This, this is, aha, ha, ha, I knew it, I bloody knew it. Of course, magic is real, I told them. I told them all Lorne is not crazy, ah. Those gods have decided to smile down upon me. Boy, do you know what this is? Lorne hadn't realized he was conversing with himself at this point. The boy was still swallowed by the fear and realization that someone was lying dead right in front of him. Someone was killed by the man wearing a smile before him. Lorne watched the boy fall to his knees. His head fell into his two hands. Get up, you fool. Don't you understand what this is? Look, look, damn it. They call this a magic wand. These things could level an entire kingdom. His excitement wasn't shared as the boy continued to show a shattered mind. Do you know what this means, boy? Do you bloody know how long I've been waiting for this? Wake up, damn you, wake up. In a moment of panic Lorne remembered the pendant, so he ducked down and reached into the boy's robes. He yanked the chain free and tucked it into his pocket. The youth was still stuck in his hysterics that he didn't react nor say a word. He merely sat on his knees, shivering whilst uttering gibberish. Seeing this Lorne felt a cold heaviness gathering in his heart. There? There is nothing more I can do for you, is there? If you choose to remain in this state, then I... I must do what is necessary. Lorne stepped behind the boy and gingerly pressed the barrel of the revolver to the back of the shivering boy's head. He took a large gulp, wiping the profuse sweat away from his aged features. His hand was shaking, his entire body shivering as though ice swam through his veins. He gritted his teeth and roared to the heavens. Don't make me do this. Get up now to you boy damn you. A few moments later, the spacious hall was married with yet another sound of a single gunshot. Bang! Chapter 6 The Drifter and the Fool 2 As Lorne exited the dim, underground space, leaving behind the lifeless form of the young companion he had known for so long, a wave of unexpected regret washed over him. The weight of his actions, the finality of the choice he had made began to settle in with each step he took away from the scene. Memories of their time together, the bond formed in the absence of the boy's family, played through his mind, juxtaposed starkly against the cold, irreversible act he had just committed. The tunnel that had led them to this fateful encounter now seemed to echo with the heavy burden of Lorne's conscience. His breaths were labored, not just from physical exertion, but from the emotional turmoil that churned within him. He longed for the numbing comfort of mead, for anything to wash away the bitter taste of guilt that lingered on his tongue. Instead, sweat mingled with the grime on his face, 
and his own spirit was as sour as stale tea. Clutching the wooden wand in his hand, Lorne felt the rough texture of the mithril ebony wood against his skin, a tactile reminder of the reality he now faced. The tool, potentially a key to untold power, felt like a cold burden in the aftermath of the violence. His connection to his own body felt tenuous as if he were a spectator to his actions, a feeling that only deepened his sense of alienation from the person he once was. Beyond the tunnel, he could see a rectangular light beating against the closed door. Lorne rushed ahead. He cared little for the pain mounted within his muscles. He pressed forward like a staggering bull, feeling as though he could almost taste the freedom. His heartbeat continually pounded against his heavy and loud steps. The light approached as his feet hastened. Lorne was inches away from the door. He finally reached the end of the tunnel and practically ripped the door wide open. He rushed into the blinding light, but what he found inside had halted him on his two tired feet at once. Lorne found himself back in that room with the open space, where those same droplets of water fell from the roofed pipes above. Only this time there were no dead bodies here, only that same radio playing smooth jazz. A terrible coldness forced Lorne's entire body to shake as cold sweats trailed down the side of his face. He tried to turn around. The door had vanished. Lorne frantically glared at the spacious room. He couldn't fathom what was going on. But by chance, he made contact with the wand in his grasp. His heart started to thrum quicker, and Lorne soon realized what fate had beheld him. He desperately fished into his pockets for the protective pendant. He found nothing, and now Lorne understood. He had fallen into their trap. Suddenly the sounds of palms clapping could be heard. Footsteps echoed from afar. In the near distance, unearthing from the shadows, was a fellow dressed in a long, dark hood. Lorne's heart sank immediately once his sight met the shadowy figure. The fellow appeared into the open light, and after removing his hood a hairless youth with brown skin stood before him. He was tall and broad-shouldered wearing a cold mask that carried dark amber eyes. Peculiar enough, he carried black diamond tattoos against his left cheek, strewn down towards his chin. Lorne couldn't move. Even his voice had run away from him presently. The dark-skinned fellow then made an odd gesture, hand signs, slow and deliberate, similar to a Buddhist monk or an anime character, weaving hand seals. He raised his right hand. On Ms. Zorn, he spoke darkly. A red light gathered around his palm, and then the same palm started to glow like the burning sun. He clenched his fists, and the glowing light subsided into the grip, Tiny, fast, fast-moving red and orange particles were dancing around the fist like fireflies. He aimed his fist towards the stunned Lorne and unclenched. Chi-Yi screeched forth and a surging orange light suddenly flashed forward and consumed Lorne in moments. The latter found his entire bones soaked in what felt like burning air. He would have screamed but more grimly enough. He noticed he couldn't move a single inch of his body anymore. Rows of sweat spread across his face, and Lorne's skin was almost doused in liquid flame. His veins bulged cruelly against his face, whilst blood tricked down his nostrils and eyes. The rattled, lizard-like eyes of Lorne could do nothing but stare weakly at the shadows, suddenly converging all around him. Someone was clapping their hands from his rear again. With each echoing clap, he felt his heart grow colder. Two more figures unearthed themselves into the foray a slender male and a shorter female. Lorne had never experienced such intense fear in his entire life, and it escalated the moment the man on the left removed his dark hood. If he could speak, Lorne would surely be questioning himself about this familiar face, the same face he had shot point-blank. It's delightful to see you again, Mr. Air. What was it you said your name was? The young man, who introduced himself as Pax, rubbed his chin thoughtfully, trying to recall a name he was never actually given. The girl beside him soon followed suit, removing her hood to reveal violet silky strands of hair tumbling down to just above her shoulders. Her skin was as pale as snow, her eyes dark with a peculiar deathly gray ring circling them. She cast a cold glare towards Lorne before handing a sealed pouch to the jovial man by her side, who was heckling away. Ahaha, I told you, didn't I? Mr. Lorne would certainly take the shot. The girl elbowed his descending arm away from her shoulders without looking at him. The coward was supposed to run, 
she said in a childlike voice. Her pout would have been almost cute if it wasn't for the white blood lust gathering within her eyes. It was a fair bet, Yuki. So don't you go disturbing my confidence, okay? I've exhausted all my red-taped silkworms. Unless you're willing to compensate me for a puppet, I suggest you keep that wand away from my people. Pax warned her with a jovial smile. Yuki stood like a statue. Her head turned towards the frozen Lorn as though she wasn't listening to the man beside her. Yet her eyes were not fixed on Lorne himself. Soon Lorne saw a shadow approaching him from his rear, with all the frantic questions circling in his thoughts. He was surprised to feel a warm arm wrapping itself around his shoulder. He still couldn't control any parts of his body, only his bloodshot eyeballs moved. Then a warm whisper fell against his face, and the voice appeared. Long time no see old friend. He could place a face with the voice instantly, and that face appeared in front of him. Short red curls falling wildly over a dour freckled face. Lorne stretched his lizard eyes as wide as he could, bewitched by a mixture of feelings. At the forefront he was stunned into disbelieving this scene was real. If you could talk, I'm sure you would have quite a lot of vile things to say to me. A childlike heckle left the young fellow's lips, and Lorne was torn with himself. Blue eyes as clear as the endless southern seas, his round face adorned with freckles. He saw the boy dying beneath his feet. I, I killed him. WWH, why is he? I always liked you, Lorne, and I never held any grudges towards the way you treated me. After all, who else took notice of me, fed me, and clothed me? I am thankful. Truly fufufu, I really was. Despite the choice you made, of course I can understand why you pulled the trigger. I might have been disappointed if you hadn't in truth. Nevertheless, this all must come as a complete shock to you. But, worry not my old friend. He spoke with a soft smile, whilst gently rubbing Lorne against the side of his hefty meaty face. Don't be scared, you see. I have chosen you to help me with something special. From the very first day we met. You remember? I was nestled on the side of the road, covered in all manners of scratches and burns. Nobody stopped to offer me a piece of bread. But you, of course. You saw something within me, perhaps a naive child, foolish enough to follow your every whim without uttering a single word in protest? Ha ha ha, whatever it was. From that moment onwards, I had already marked you. His words flowed like choral music. Lorne was beyond frightened beyond belief at this point unable to fathom any sane reasoning, nor could he truly believe any of this was happening. This, this has to be a lie. Why yes, I am under an illusion? My magic it has to be that. The boy brought his face inches away from Lorne's frozen mask. His sallow skin stained with red blood gleamed with beads of sweat gathered against his horrible-looking face. Hey prince, he did try to kill you. Sure you want to let him off so easily. There was a devious smirk against Pax's face whilst he spoke that, but he quickly regretted it once he met another firm elbow to his chest. The scene made the fiery-headed youth laugh. The boy whom Lorne had spent beside for so long was a completely different fellow before him. He walked away, where he eventually brought his feet directly across the girl called Yuki. He rubbed her softly on the top of her head. Her cold eyes didn't change, but one could see the slight affectionate mannerisms towards it. Humph, so the prince is the only one you wish to tolerate in your heart? Well, can't say that it isn't painful. Pax remarked with a faux show of annoyance. The quietest fellow within the room snorted aloud. The bald young man with smooth brown pecan-colored skin. He had striking tattoos drawn beneath his two eyelids, tiny black stars reaching his lower cheeks. Can we keep this process moving? We have no time for useless pleasantries, he announced coldly. The rest of the robed youths nodded in agreement. The redhead boy reappeared before Lorne soon enough, this time devoid of the false smile or feigned foolishness he had adopted for all those years. The young man now bore the detached gaze of a noble and the enigmatic shadow of a murderer. Lorne's mind was awash with dreadful thoughts. How long had the pitiable boy concealed his true nature from him? How had things reached such a dire state? The only thing more horrifying than the agonizing pain spreading through every part of his body was his inability trying to comprehend it all, as if his thoughts were amplified through a megaphone, resonating with each harrowing image he envisioned. 
The boy with the familiar face peered intently into Lorne's bloodshot eyes, nearly as crimson as blood itself. Perhaps you're wondering how long it has been this way, he speculated. The interesting thing about magic is that you can never be certain what is real. Consider you and me. What I perceive as truth and what you feel can be vastly different, even though we are in each other's company. To put it another way, what seems like a month to you could be, I don't know, merely a few hours to someone like me. Lorne's wide eyes reflected his profound shock. He had invested immense resources and time in understanding these almost mythical beings. Yet, despite all the ancient texts and legendary scriptures, one theme remained consistent when describing these individuals. In the presence of mages, also known as arcanists, catching them off guard was virtually impossible. He pondered the protective amulet he had always carried due to rumors about these secretive people. However, he grimly remembered what he had done with the second one. Looking into the bright blue eyes of the young man before him, the expression he received filled Lorne's heart with dread. Escaping is not an option, Mr. Lorne, because you have an important role to play. A very important one, I might add. So important I wasted very expensive silkworms to create that nice illusion of you killing us both. The youth who called himself Pack spoke this. Lorne felt a burning sensation gathering in his eyes. Swiftly afterward, the expected tears started to stream down his sallow, almost purple, puss-filled skin. Oh no, don't be frightened, Mr. Lorne. The youth stroked back the stiffened black strands of hair on top of Lorne's head. You tried to kill me, and I understand why you had to do it. I would like to tell you that I carry no such ill intentions towards you, my old friend. So please, I beg of you. For without your sacrifice, our mission cannot be completed. Trust me, old friend all right. Trust in me, and let me take you into a new world. A world filled with wonderful sights and splendors fitting for only the most deserving of beings. You will understand once it begins, but you will be reborn like a phoenix. The boy clicked his two fingers and walked steadily towards the trio behind him. Lorne suddenly noticed a ring of pale encircling him, and once the ring formed another was drawn against the floor and another and many more salt circles appeared on the ground until layers of spiraling white enclosed him into its center. The trio stepped back, and the girl among them turned off the radio. A bright smile spread across the boy with red hair's youthful face, revealing a sadistic grin that struck fear into Lorne's heart. Let's begin. By now, the fisherman should have made his last sail. So let us open the door. The door to another world? A sense of dread washed over Lorne. The boy approached him and used two fingers to forcefully pry open his mouth. To Lorne's horror, he silently watched as the redhead slowly inserted a blackened, rough thumb, adorned with a golden ring that sparkled with majesty, into his mouth. Open wide, Lorne. It's time to be reborn. Fourth Death Chapter 7 Shoba Shoba POV The Tokyo summer was a stark contrast to the summers in London. In Tokyo, the festive seasons felt like a grand celebration, not just of the golden sunlight that bathed the city, but also of the beginning of a festive period, always a joyous occasion filled with vibrancy and good cheer. The lively town was decked out in colorful attire and elegant dresses. Shoba cast a whimsical glare around the bustling surroundings. The streets were alive with people wearing colorful face masks, the air filled with the playful chimes of toiling bells being rung by elders in crimson and orange kimonos. Stray dogs sought refuge from the intense heat by seeking the shadows being cast by the giant-sized floats passing along the streets. Locals would stop beside these estranged pups and gently feed them. Shoba loved Tokyo and couldn't think of anywhere else he would rather be. Today he was dressed in light attire, shorts and comfortable sandals, and rode his bicycle through the bustling streets with a cheerful demeanor. Having been born and raised in London, he stood out among the locals here quite easily. His father, a property developer of African descent, and his mother, an Osaka native and neuroscientist, had relocated to Tokyo when Shoba was just 10. His younger sister had been born when he was just four years old, so most of her life was spent within this bustling city. Shoba had grown to love Tokyo for its dynamic energy and unmatched culinary delights. On this particular day, he made a deliberate detour through Mount Takao, eager to witness the breathtaking spectacle of the sakura blossoms in full bloom. 
The beautiful pink petals shone brilliantly under the sun's gaze. Shoba's attention shifted from the towering oaks covered in pink bushes as he passed by his favorite street vendor, Old Lady Ma. Her expertise just so happened to be one of his favorite delicacies. Freshly made dango. Bringing his bike to a gentle stop near her stall, Shoba greeted her with a broad smile, his white teeth gleaming in the sunlight. He warmly addressed the elderly vendor, a familiar figure he had passed by and interacted with many times over the years. Good morning, Ma San. The old lady finally realized who the young brown-faced boy was. Her previously still eyes instantly filled with warmth. Shobakuin, you're late. Come, come. My dango won't eat itself. How are your parents and little Ringo doing? Shoba, unhesitatingly, accepted the four skewers laden with the seasonal pink, white, and green balls of goodness. He devoured the delicacies, relishing the burst of sweet flavors in his mouth, to the point where he closed his eyes, resembling someone intoxicated with delight. In them. All good, all good. Gulp these are incredible, Ma San. Got any more? Old Lady Ma chuckled at his enthusiasm and offered him more laded neatly within her silver steam bowl. You remind me of my son. When he was young, he too couldn't get enough of Dango. You have the same energetic spirit as him, she reminisced. While Old Lady Ma was lost in her memories, Shoba, still enjoying the sweets, noticed a large gathering nearby. What's that about? He inquired, looking over towards the formation of monks gently walking through the street. H.M.? Oh, they're preparing for the Yule festivities. I think they'll be building a huge float in the form of a pink and azure dragon this year. Two dragons? Shoba asked puzzled. Old Lady Ma nodded, her mouth forming a distant smile. Once every hundred or so years, the people celebrate the birth of the twin dragons, destined to spend an eternity in each other's embrace. And for the next hundred years, the fates have promised us an abundance of bountiful riches and peace. Shoba found the tale a bit cliché for his taste, but he did enjoy watching the construction of the floats. As he finished his third dango, his phone vibrated against his thigh. Pulling it out, he saw Mom on the caller ID but the call ended before he could answer. An expected text soon followed. Hey Shoba, don't forget we're having a family dinner today before the festival. Try not to detour before coming home. Oh, and thank Grandmama for the dango. I'll be paying her back tomorrow, smiley face. Shoba grinned crookedly. When did I become so predictable? He thought wryly to himself. Remembering the family dinner, he realized he needed to leave. Ah, Ma San. I've got to. Head home? That's quite all right. Tell your father to stop hiding money in my wicker baskets. Feeding his children isn't that difficult. TSK, I don't need the money, old lady Ma said warmly. Children? Shoba was a little confused by that. Oh yes, did you think you were the only one who enjoys my dango so much? Chuckles, Ringo may seem serious and shy on the outside, but her appetite almost rivals yours, Shoba Kuen. He shivered, his face showing a tight-lipped smile. Shy, more like cold-hearted. He was reminded of that cold and indifferent look of his exceptionally talented sister. He couldn't imagine her with a mouthful of dough balls. But when he did so, he couldn't hold down his laughter, knowing his family was doting on him right now. He didn't waste any more time and quickly said his goodbyes. Strangely enough, he caught the old woman staring at him with a deeply saddened look. Hmm. Shoba stood still, visibly disturbed by the face old Ma was making. He reached out his hand and wrapped his arm around her frail back. Shoba felt her delicate body warmly tuck securely in his hold. He tapped his lips against her forehead and smiled. I'll pay you another visit tomorrow, Ma San. Don't you worry? He raised his thumb and winked. Soon enough, he mounted his bike again and rode down the road towards his home. What he failed to see was the old woman's gaze never trailing away from his back as he rode down the street. Unbeknownst to him, a mysterious glint remained concealed within her old gaze until he faded down the winding road through the park. Be strong, Shoba. Shoba arrived at his familiar neighborhood. He slightly raised his chin, gazing towards the azure skies where the sun hung at its peak, bathing the cream and limestone houses in a splendid golden light. His house. Number 77, featured a green door, 
two stories, a small lawn, and a newly fitted mailbox. Noticing two sedans parked outside, he knew his parents had already arrived. He hastily pedaled his bike into the driveway, timing it perfectly so he skidded to a stop right beside his lawn. Shoba dismounted and walked his bike to the side of his housing complex, where he was enthusiastically greeted by the barks of his golden retriever, Moo Moo. He knelt down, greeting the joyful pup with skilled pets along its soft golden fur. Hey there, you adorable furball. Where's everyone else? Shoba inquired. Moo Moo responded with excited barks and swiftly leaped into Shoba's arms, showering him with affectionate licks. Laughing childishly, Shoba looked up at the gray steps leading to the closed white door of his home. An inexplicable sense of unease, which had lingered with him, throughout the day resurfaced again. With a resigned sigh, he ascended the metallic, clanging stairs. Once inside, the light echo of his footsteps on the hardwood floor brought him back to the present. Oops, forgot to take off my shoes, he mumbled to himself, realizing his oversight. Halfway along the corridor, Shoba caught the scent of a delicious aroma filling his nostrils, spurning his stomach to growl in response. Composing himself, he continued to the dining area at the far end of the corridor. The medium-sized room was filled with bookcases and a large square table with a glass finish, surrounded by five mahogany chairs. At the head of the table sat his father, Mr. Thomas, an aged man with a salt-and-pepper goatee and thin-rimmed circular glasses. His deep almond hazelnut eyes briefly shifted from the paper he was perusing to greet Shoba with a seldom-seen warm smile. My son has returned, he announced proudly. Across the table sat a gracefully aging beauty, her raven-colored hair tumbling past her shoulders. Her intriguing brown eyes shone upon an olive-skinned face, and she smiled cheerfully. You're just about on time, Shoba. Come, sit down. Ringo is just washing her hands in the bathroom. Oh, and how was your day? His mom asked him. Shoba took a seat between his two parents, noticing his mother's tender gaze and his father's stern one as Mr. Thomas returned to his newspaper. Patiently seated, Shoba scanned the various trays of food on the table, his finger tapping rhythmically as he strategized how to enjoy as much of the delicious fare as possible. Engrossed in his culinary calculations, he didn't notice when the door beside him finally opened. The sound of it breaking the room's calmness caused Mr. Thomas to look up briefly, his brows lifting slightly before resettling into peaceful lines. Shoba had heard her before he saw her. Ringo, a foot shorter than he was, possessed smooth red sand-like skin and a full head of curly black hair styled into afro puffs. Her large eyes were cute, but her cold demeanor often fractured that adorable image. She moved swiftly to the seat opposite her brother, dressed in hiney socks, dungarees, and a light white top, a small golden necklace with a striking blue gem of a tiny goddess in the pendant adorning her tall neck. Shoba awkwardly smiled and scratched the back of his head as her eyes met his own. Ringo, what took you so long? Their mother asked. Ah. She sounded a little nervously. Look, the food's almost cold now. Come on, let's say thanks before we eat. Dear, isn't that enough light reading for now? And Shoba, take your elbows off the table, Mrs. Thomas directed organizing her family before she led them through a short version of their usual grace before they all tucked into dinner. Ah, it's great to be home, Shoba thought to himself, after a long morning of parkour and judo training. A lovely warm meal was just what he needed. The family enjoyed a sumptuous three-course dinner featuring assorted meats and fish, vegetables, different kinds of kinds of rice, peeled pork, and beef. The second course brought sweets and cakes, fruits, and a choice of tea or something stronger, with bowls of sake reserved for the parents. Time passed pleasantly, and as evening arrived, dinner concluded. Ringo patted her stomach approvingly and shot her brother a curious scowl. I heard you don't plan on taking the top Eastern Prefecture scientific exams. Hmm, could it be Big Brother is scared of showing everyone he's too weak? Her smile suggested she was playing but those cold eyes told Shoba otherwise. After swallowing a mouthful of sweet beef, he picked up the handkerchief and dabbled the corners of his mouth with careful precision, purposefully taking his time to answer. Aha, uh -huh, and what's it to you? 
And if you must know my omission from that poxy test is simply down to my lack of interest towards schools such as those. I rather not waste my time with those snobbish places. A downpour of anger filled her chest and Ringo flared up, slamming her palms against the table. Waste of time. How can you sit there and say that when countless people would give anything to have the opportunity you have? Do you know how many people make it to the last phase out of the 1,000 applicants? 17. And here you are pretending as it's not one of the most important choices of your damned lazy life. Ringo. Your language. Their mother quipped furiously. The young girl immediately blushed realizing her mouth was a little too sharp in front of her parents. Mr. Thomas merely chuckled deciding not to place himself in the mix of this argument. A deep sigh escaped Ringo's mouth. Realizing this was how her brother always was, her cold, indifferent gaze returned again. All I'm saying is, it's not so bad to have a little drive in life. Hey, now that's not completely true. I do have goals and aspirations. For example, getting you angry all the time has become number one on the list of things I take great pride in recently. You? Ringo growled, her cold glare deepening, leaving no doubt in Shoba's mind that, were their parents not present, she might have lunged at him with claws and teeth bared. Seizing the opportunity to exploit her restraint due to their parents' presence, Shoba indulged in the rare sense of security their company provided. After pushing Ringo to the brink of frustration, Mr. Thomas set down his paper and cleared his throat purposefully loud. Shoba, your sister is right. You need ambition. The future you envision is shaped by your actions today. I've always encouraged you to find your own path, and I admire your nonchalant attitude to an extent. But there comes a time when enough is enough. One day, you'll have your own home, perhaps a wife and children. It's vital that you understand the importance of building and nurturing a life, Mr. Thomas advised, propping his chin a little higher to impress his wife seated beside him. Shoba couldn't help but lower his gaze. He wasn't lazy. Academically and in sports, he excelled in everything. He regularly achieved 99% on all tests he took. Moreover, he was proficient in more than 10 instruments and fluent in six languages, including his native tongues of Yoruba and Mandarin, inherited from his parents. The term prodigy was often thrown around loosely, but in Shoba's case, academic professionals had been using it since his childhood. The issue was that he, much to everyone's dismay, held no great regard for his innate talents. His father still remembered the day a 10-year-old Shoba, when offered a chance to attend one of the most prestigious private schools in Eastern Asia, had emphatically declined, expressing more interest in extreme sports or, failing that, becoming a farmer. In a bid to focus his energies, they enrolled Shoba in judo, boxing, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and mixed martial arts classes once he was old enough. While Shoba took great pride in learning these skills, they still couldn't sway his mind. The whims of a 10-year-old are often not taken seriously, yet, as Shoba had declared in his youth, that was exactly the path he chose. He spent his summers helping a distant relative on a farm in the plains, far from the city hustle. His time was devoted to scaling heights with his gymnast friends in the adrenaline-fueled art of parkour. Now turning 16 this fall, even Shoba was finding it increasingly difficult to cling to his dreams of freedom. Under the intense scrutiny of his family, he felt like the loneliest boy in the world. If only they could see things from my perspective, he thought. But no one understands what's it like to not know where to go. If only they listened to me. As for you, Ringo, your mother and I have explained the importance of communication, especially with your own kin, Mr. Thomas said, directing a piercing glare at his daughter. Ringo straightened her back stiffly, feeling sweat trickle down her spine. Humph, I hope you haven't forgotten everything we discussed. It's fine to be zealous for improvement, but remember, humility distinguishes you from the arrogant. Never forget that, both of you. Mrs. Thomas watched as her children nodded in agreement, relieved that the argument had subsided, if only for a moment. Ha ha ha, good good. Now then, back to my paper. Mr. Thomas concluded, returning to his reading with a sense of satisfaction. Chapter 8 Star Fall A Most Terrible Night Shoba POV The late evening arrived and Mr. and Mrs. Thomas had long since left the dining table, settling into the next room. They sat on comfortable lounge chairs away from the dining area. 
Mr. Thomas, who usually occupied the sole recliner, chose to cozy up beside his wife tonight. Engrossed in a light-hearted debate, they were only vaguely aware of the local news blaring in the background. Meanwhile, Shoba and Ringo were tasked with cleaning duties. Silence hung heavily in the air between them since they had started. Shoba, pausing from drying the washed porcelain plates, glanced over his shoulder at his sister, letting out a deep sigh. Ringo, hmm, let's, ahem, let's set aside our differences. He spoke in a warmth-laced tone. To Suda, it was better for them to be friends than enemies. After a while, all of the bickering was getting tiresome. What's there to set aside? We don't get along, we never have, and possibly never will. She declared coldly. B, but how can you say something like that? We're family, and families sometimes don't always get along. But that doesn't mean we can't try to make things better. He felt a genuine hurt hearing her say those words. Of course, he knew things had been tense with them recently, but to Shoba he expected them both to grow out of this phase. He had heard from his friends about similar relationships they held with their siblings, and how time and age brought them closer. I mean, who didn't have an annoying little sister, right? Pfft, like you really believe that? Scoffed Ringo. Why wouldn't I? Shoba asked, frowning. Ringo placed down the utensils, her perfectly shaped oval eyes fixating on Shoba with an intensity that conveyed growing fury. Don't try to play the perfect brother now. You've always gotten whatever you wanted and never cared for a second how your selfishness has made my life hell. Her voice trembled with emotion. Shoba was taken aback by her words. He was acutely aware of the pressure he had faced since school, which led his parents to give him more leeway these days, fearful of damaging his mental health as he grew up. But that still didn't stop him from making sure the spotlight was pointed towards his sister rather than him. Hearing Ringo's harsh accusations left him both incensed and deeply hurt. It was because of her that he chose to forego pursuing this so-called genius intellect that others had fawned over him for. She was the reason he chose to allow his light to dim, just so she could have a chance to be brighter than him. His ire boiled as he couldn't imagine her being so selfish. I'm the selfish one? Shoba retorted ferociously, unwilling to let Ringo's accusation go unchallenged. You're the one who can't get over the fact that I'm good at something you're not. Life isn't a competition, and if you desire so much of what I have, then by all means, take it. I've tried to let you take center stage, yet here you are, blaming me for your shortcomings, just like you always do. Poor Ringo. Angry at the world because she can't get what she wants. A look of fury flashed against Ringo's face. Why you? How dare you? I'm not scared of you. It's about time someone told you some home truths for once. Shoba barked back with venom. He was tired of this nonsense between them both. This childish behavior of hers was beginning to grow old. You're the worst brother ever. I wish, I wish I wasn't born into this stupid family. Then I'd never have to see your stupid face again. All you do is torment my life. I hate you. In a fit of rage, Ringo grabbed the nearest plate and hurled it at Shoba. Fortunately, he had anticipated her move and managed to dodge the flying dish with a sidestep, reminiscent of some of the judo footwork he had practiced over and over again. Smash! What's with all that ruckus back there? Mr. Thomas's voice roared from the other room. Shoba, standing amid the shattered porcelain, felt a mix of shock and adrenaline coursing through his veins. His breathing was slightly erratic, and he could feel warm beads of sweat dotted against his face. After a moment's reflection on what had just transpired, he turned his shaken gaze to Ringo. Her large hazel and brown eyes were now brimming with tears. Her frustration had simmered to its boiling point. Shoba uttered a simple sound, watching helplessly as she stormed down the hall. With a defeated sigh, he knelt to delicately gather the broken pieces feeling the one who had been hurt the most during another one of their long-standing feuds. Sometimes, I feel like I don't understand her at all. Grappling with a sense of guilt, he felt his shoulders tremble with coldness and isolation. After placing the last shard into a secured black trash bag, he heard footsteps. Looking up, he saw his mother standing in the doorway, her arms crossed, and her expression far from pleased. Shoba suddenly felt a deep, non-physical pain in his chest, 
the kind that couldn't be easily healed with a band-aid or medication. His mother's disappointment weighed heavily on him. Mrs. Thomas sighed before casually approaching the boy still sitting on his knees in the middle of the kitchen. Her slender olive hands reached forward and rubbed Shoba's coarse afro hair. What were you both fighting about this time then? She asked with a little sadness twinged against her tone. Shoba remained silent for a few moments, trying to carefully piece together what he was going to say. He wanted to blame it all on Ringo. After all, she was the one who tossed the plate at him, and she was the one who couldn't let go of this unusual rivalry between the two. Shoba felt deeply frustrated because he wasn't sure what to do anymore. When he chose to go against what the adults had expected of him, he was called lazy and too aloof. And if he tried to embrace his so-called genius, his own sister was against him. All in all, this whole mess felt like the world was unable to allow him to live freely. He lifted his tired gaze and beheld his mom. It's, it's nothing I can't handle, he answered weakly whilst avoiding his mother's gaze directly. Sigh, you've always been a brave boy. You get that from me, you know, ahaha, but you should try not to always shoulder the burdens of the world on your own. It's not your job to do that. You understand what I'm saying to you, right? Shoba nodded his head repeatedly. He felt the cold anger slowly moving away from his heart the moment his mother's warm hands touched him. And don't think too much about Ringo. She, she's growing up so quickly these days, and just like you and I, she too wants to be brave and protect the things closest to her. It's one of my greatest wishes that one day both you and her will be the best of friends. So, try your best with her, okay? Why yes, mom, I will try. Shoba wiped away the warm tears from his eyes whilst he responded. Chapter 9. Starfall. A Most Terrible Night, Too. The eventful evening slowly faded, and the cool nightingale breeze dutifully took its place. Shoba had just finished cleaning the dishes and arranging them neatly in their respective places within the wooden cabinets. He wiped the sweat away from his brow before a black bag appeared in the corner of his eyes. He frowned again remembering the broken plates and the incident with Ringo earlier on. He wasn't going to dump the plates into the same place as the usual trash, just in case the sharp edges tore through the bags, causing another disaster not worth thinking about to occur once the bin was filled with food scraps. Instead, Shoba decided his best course of action would be to carry the broken plates into the outside trash bin. He tightened the knot against the black bag and searched the hall for his sandals. He placed his feet into the warm footwear and walked towards the door. Gold latches had already been put on for the night. So Shoba unhooked the chains away before twisting the iron handle and opening the door. The outdoor chill fell upon him like a bucket of cold water. To make matters worse, he was only wearing a gray shirt and beige shorts with socks. Suffice it to say, Shoba wasn't adequately dressed to brave the frigid night cold. Despite the frosty winds, there was a soothing stillness in the night sky. Agile as a feline, he hopped over the railing, landing perfectly on the fence, and with a deft adjustment of his footing, he gracefully tapped the fence with his heel before casually hopping onto the hard ground. The bag filled with porcelain pieces clattered lightly during his descent, but he hardly made any noise. His parkour skills rendered his movements as light as a feather these days. After depositing the bag of broken porcelain in the trash bin, Shoba wiped his hands on his shirt and strolled to the edge of the pavement. The residential street was quiet tonight, its stillness only broken by the flickering streetlights and the whirring of fireflies dancing in the air. Looking up into the vast darkness, Shoba was captivated by the brightly lit stars stitched against the twilight tonight. He had always been fond of the twilight skies, the mysterious constellations, and the solitary, cold moon. Moments like these brought him a sense of inner peace. As he gazed at the stars, he pondered the possibility of life beyond the vast darkness, wondering if there were other worlds with beings facing similar challenges as he was. Deep in his heart, Shoba yearned for more than what the surface world offered. He wanted to witness the stars in all their glory and soar across tall mountain peaks. Perhaps that was the reason for all his woes, simply because he didn't belong to this world? Lost in thought, he found himself sitting on the prickly grass in front of his family home. Stretching his arm towards the night sky, he reached for the moon as if he could hold it in his bare hands. Perceive that which cannot be seen with the eye. Amusing himself with the childlike thought, 
Miyamoto Musashi was one of his favorite books. He practically knew all his quotes word for word. His eventual chuckle shattered the silence as he recognized the absurdity of his actions. The brief respite outside had worked wonders on his mood. His earlier troubles now felt like distant echoes. He even found himself prepared to mend the rift with Ringo. Rising to his feet and brushing off the earth clinging to his clothes, he cast one final glance at the enchanting moon, filled with gratitude for the beauty of life and the world that surrounded him. Shoba pivoted on his heels, ready to walk back to his house when a sudden scream behind him made him turn around vigilantly. The dark house adjacent to where he stood was slowly lighting up again. He tensed up as he suddenly heard more alarmed voices screeching bloody murder at the top of their lungs across the dark residential street. Shoba panicked and unconsciously started taking a few steps back. Upon his fifth step retreating, he felt the ground beneath him rumble. The quake was so unexpected that he fell face first and landed on his stomach against the cold grass. Raising his head, Shoba witnessed a startling sight. High in the twilight starry sky above, there was something there, a bluish figure hovering above him. From his position, Shoba couldn't discern its details too well. It was small, akin to a toddler in stature, but its entire form was blue with pale veins visibly marking its body. He rubbed his eyes several times, questioning the reality of what he was seeing. Is that, is that a, child? No, children couldn't fly nor levitate in the air like that. Humans as a whole didn't possess such prowess. So then, what in God's name is that thing? Before he could fully comprehend the nature of this alien creature, a series of crackling sounds filled the air. Circular force fields resembling those seen in fantasy comics had begun to manifest, their frantic blue hues pulsating with otherworldly energy that made the air pop and crackle as though electrical currents waned. These phenomena, reminiscent of portals, violently whirled into existence, unleashing a tempest of chaos upon the tranquil neighborhood that he had always known. One by one, parked cars fell victim to the relentless pull of these portals, their metallic bodies drawn inexorably into the swirling vortexes. Half devoured by one portal, they were then forcefully ejected through another, propelled with alarming speed, and sent crashing into the ground. The same harrowing scene repeated itself across the residential streets as homes emptied and panicked residents fled, only to stumble unwittingly into paths of destruction. High-pitched cries sang darkly across the air as bodies were torn asunder, consumed by the unfathomable forces at play. Once more, the earth convulsed violently beneath Shoba's feet, jolting him upright. His eyes darted frantically across the chaotic scene unfolding around him, and a trembling whisper escaped his lips. W what is happening? His breath caught in his throat as he beheld a spectacle beyond comprehension. Lightning crackled and danced across the sky, accompanied by a majestic blaze of blue fire erupting into existence. The ground trembled beneath the onslaught once more, and the earth was scorched by fiery tendrils that licked at its surface. Shoba saw the cars, once stationary, now being torn apart like mere playthings in the grasp of this otherworldly force. He was frozen on his heels almost questioning whether or not he was present in the real world any longer. A chill of fear violently gripped Shoba's heart so much that he could only stare at all the madness he was suddenly made to witness. Soon enough he found a sensible thought, what felt like every single fiber of his being screamed for him to flee at once. I, I need to get out of his nightmare. Focus, Shoba. Focus. He placed his shaking palm between his chest and steadied himself, rising to his feet with unsteady resolve. Though his legs trembled like leaves in the wind, he forced himself to maintain control, his senses sharp and alert. The chaos surrounding him was beyond anything he had ever imagined, yet he refused to succumb to despair at this very moment. Fear was the mind killer he rehearsed to himself over and over. The same fear he suppressed just before he took his first leap off a 10-story housing complex. We've been through chaos before, W. You can overcome this the same. Very slowly Shoba turned against his heels. Vuvuvate. A rasping voice, like a ghostly whisper, sent a chill down Shoba's spine. He dared to turn around, his heart pounding with silent dread, 
only to find a middle-aged woman standing on his front lawn. Her eyes, bloodshot and bulging, bore into his soul with an intensity that turned his blood cold. Shoba's breath remained trapped in his throat as he observed the woman's trembling lips spattered with droplets of crimson. Her entire clothes were disheveled and mostly torn. She was also missing her shoes. A slight grimace appeared across his face, noticing the wounds against her feet. Despite this, she was somehow glistening with a beautiful dread beneath the moonlight's glow. In the eerie silence that enveloped them, the woman's mouth moved in a futile attempt to form words, her voice drowned in a sea of incomprehensible murmurs. Each stuttered utterance seemed to struggle against an invisible barrier, fighting to break free from the confines of her shattered reality. Essa, save Mmeha. A look of horror finally emerged across his face. His eyes trailed the crimson pool beneath her. Half of her lower body was missing, and copious amounts of blood squelched from a large hole against her side. W.H. What the actual? Boom! Boom! Crash! Emerging from his trance, Shoba reluctantly tore his gaze away from the haunting scene of destruction and death surrounding him. Throughout his 16 years, Shoba had never encountered death so intimately. Yet, on that fateful night, he faced a catastrophe so devastating that it claimed countless lives without discrimination. What struck him most profoundly was humanity's stark fragility, its vulnerability laid bare in the face of true peril. Understanding the complexity of his own mind, he couldn't help but weave a web of truths and constants around the disaster unfolding before him, which only added to the layer of madness currently weighing against him heavily. Suddenly, a loud clattering sound shattered his reverie, reminiscent of tables being smashed to pieces. His heart sank, and without hesitation, he leaped up the stone steps with the agility of a leopard. And know what the hell was that? To his relief, the door stood ajar. Shoba almost tore the hinges open as he flung the door aside. Darkness enveloped inside of his home. The electricity had been cut, yet his mind remained fixated on the red glow emanating from the end of the hall. Please, please be okay. Please, you have to be okay. Shoba dashed across the short hall and skidded around the bend. But what his eyes met left his heart fractured into millions of pieces. Chapter 10 Starfall, Goddess? Shoba POV. He skidded around the corner, entering the dining room. His clothes clung to his body from the cold sweat. The scene Shoba found was one of complete chaos. The room was in disarray, with no piece of furniture left unscathed. The culprit, a portal shimmering with a bloody red light, as though an open doorway into hell. He couldn't make a single conscious thought at this moment. One of those things he had seen outside had appeared inside his very home. Shoba's heart sank further at the sight of his mom, half submerged within the portal, her arms stubbornly clinging to the dining table that was moving closer to the whirring phenomenon. Its existence made no coherent sense at all. M, M O M, he wailed, rushing towards her before he slid across the ground to meet her. Mrs. Thomas jolted at her son's, roar her anxiety washed away replaced by a bloodied yet relieved smile. Despite her sallow, sweat-drenched face, she seemed almost youthful with that smile. My beautiful boy. She spoke weakly. As Shoba neared the portal, he felt its magnetic pull up close. Stretching out his hand, he barely managed to grasp hold of his mom's own. The realization of her frailty sent anguish through him, but her presence spurred his determination to help her free. Hold on, don't let go of me. He groaned. Am I boy? Please don't. No. Stop talking and help me. I won't let you go. Shoba pulled with his entire might, but found this invisible force holding his mom in place. Shoba, listen to me. I need you to protect. His mom brokenly spoke. I need to protect all of you. Fight it. I won't let it take you. He could feel the strength seeping away from his body every time he attempted to pull her free. Protect her, your sister. Promise, promise me. With each pull, Shoba felt his mom being sucked deeper into the portal. Shoba felt himself being drawn closer to the portal, powerless against its pull. What the hell is this thing? And where is Dad? What the hell is going on? D Dad, where is HHE? 
Listen to me, your father and I, we we will be fine. Your sister, promise me. Ok. I, I will. But I have to save you first, Imam. Don't leave me, P please, Ger hold on. Please hold on. Shoba's grip on his mother's hand weakened until he could barely hold on to just her fingertips. Tears streamed down his face as he watched her body being drawn deeper into the portal. The more he resisted, the more the unseen force pulled her in more. He closed his eyes, fighting back his emotions. I can't, I can't, assess save her. He knew it from the moment he attempted to pull her free. Something beyond his meager strength had locked onto her. Suddenly, amid his despair, Shoba felt his mind perform something strange. Almost mirroring those strange days when he fell into a depressive state. The days when his mind completely fell into a sea of darkness. Only this time, something was different. He felt his emotions slowly seep into that familiar abyss. His eyes slowly opened. An expressionless glare masked over his quivering lips. And with a chilling resolve glazed against his eyes, his lips slowly parted. I promise. I peer promise. I will find you. I will find you wherever you are. I promise. His mom creased a warm bloody smile. My beautiful boy, s so strong. I'll be expecting you. Shoba let her hand go. Whoosh. Bang. The portal vanished, taking his mother and half of the dining room furniture with it. Once the dust settled, a haunting silence filled the room. Shoba's gaze drifted upwards. Frozen for a moment, he then heard faint footsteps from the upper floor. Energized by a surge of emotion, he was on his feet again, moving swiftly down the corridor and along the darkened hall in a trance-like state. He was unable to think clearly nor process anything he was currently feeling. The second door on his right was open, casting flickering shadows into the hallway. Without hesitation, Shoba rushed inside. In the room, a pale, oval-shaped light, taller and steadier than the previous portals, shone brightly like a door beckoning one toward a heavenly place. Unlike the others, it exerted no forceful pull. But Shoba had no time to ponder these details. His focus was singular and urgent right now. Shoba could barely make sense of the scene playing before him again. His sister, the one he fought with time and time again. His beloved little sister who once couldn't sleep without him kissing her against her forehead. Ringo stood halfway through the blindingly bright pale portal. Its intense light around the oval shape made it difficult for him to look directly at it. But he was certain he saw another figure leading Ringo by her sleeve, an ethereal being that left him quite literally stunned. Shoba wasn't sure if he was gazing at an angel right now, but she had two ivory, ram-like horns crowning her head. Her lavishly long silver hair cascaded gracefully down her slender form. But what caught Shoba off guard were her two glowing red eyes, like flaming, deathly rubies burning intensely as though her mere existence frightened the very world itself. The angelic being carried an expressionless gaze, sparing him only a fleeting glance before turning back to Ringo. Dear child, the being spoke in a watery voice. Let us be on our way. Shoba could neither believe nor understand what he was witnessing. This entire night was like a nightmare, one which had spiraled into chaos at a pace that almost drove him to insanity. Expecting defiance from his sister, he was instead met with something that shattered the last vestiges of his sanity. Ringo softly nodded her head, then turned her back on him. Ringo, stop. His voice thundered through the room's air, and his younger sister froze in her tracks. Slowly, her eyes moved towards him, finally noticing his arrival. Despite the clear signs of distress on her face, she was still beautiful, just as he remembered her to be. But her eyes were a tumult of emotions, fear, confusion, and sadness. Shoba knew his sister well enough to understand from their eye contact what she intended to do. With a wry, broken smile, Ringo mouthed, confirming his greatest fears at that point. I'm sorry, Shoba. I, I have to go now. Without hesitating a moment longer, Shoba pressed down against his heels and hurled himself towards the pair. He had barely taken two steps forward when his world abruptly came to a halt. An overwhelming force, unlike anything he had ever experienced before suddenly descended upon him. 
Shoba's world turned a dismal gray as a chilling sensation drained all color from the room. In this frozen space, his body was immobilized, but one figure remained unaffected, her blood-red gaze filled with an intensity that bordered on despair. The ethereal being wore a sadistic smile, sending shivers down Shoba's spine as tears trickled gently down his cheeks. Not of sadness, but fear. The transition from her previous emotionless stare to a mocking grin plunged him into terrible fright. In that very moment, Shoba understood if she willed to kill him, it would be as easy as swatting a fly. Powerless, he could only watch as Ringo stepped into the portal. Watching his departing sister's back, Shoba could only grind his teeth out of frustration. He tried with all his might to move, but nothing responded to his call. But then, he captured a fading watery voice drifting in the air, uttering a single, devastating phrase that seemed to encapsulate how the night had transpired. So weak, coo 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 coo. The colors gradually returned, releasing Shoba from the gray state that had immobilized him. He managed to utter only a single sound before the pale portal consumed their delicate figures entirely. Paralyzed in grief, the boy couldn't take a single step forward helplessly watching as Ringo disappeared without leaving a trace of light behind. Suddenly feeling the night's frigidly piercing cold enveloping him, Shoba held himself as his knees buckled, and he crumbled to the ground in a heap. He held himself tightly, his soft whimpers broke free finally, before escalating into the bitter wails of a broken and scared little boy. That night, Shoba cried harder than he had ever cried before. Chapter 11 Seven days later, BZZZ, BZZZZ, RIP. Breaking news this evening, we interrupt your scheduled broadcast to provide you all with an update. Following last week's nationwide disaster, the president has decided to uphold the state of emergency for another 24 days. Today marks seven days since the East was hit with the most terrible disaster recorded ever in human history. As we do every day at 6 p.m., we remember the 10 million people who lost their lives during that fateful night, zipped. A slender, bony arm reached out, the hand caressing a dark remote before placing it down as the TV's power was shut off. The hand then withdrew back into a small hole, just big enough for an infant's hand to squeeze through. Wrapped in a cocoon fashioned from heavy bedsheets and blankets, the figure inside occasionally let out soft hiccups or during the colder nights, deep long hours of bitter sobbing. Shoba had remained in this docile state for an entire week. He drank water in large gulps and nibbled on some stale bread in between his cries, but he couldn't keep down any solid food without regurgitating it out moments later. The grieving boy had gone through a critical state of shock, experiencing it in intervals across the span of a few days, occasionally having to calm himself down just to avoid passing out. Since that night his family was taken, he hadn't bathed or left the messy front room, too scared to even be away from the scene of the disaster. Deep in his heart, Shoba felt an instinctive urge to stay put and wait, though he couldn't rationalize this response, nor was he sure it was even the sane response. Yet, he chose to remain, trapped in a cocoon of warmth where he had lost his mom. Mom, Dad. The thoughts brought back a wave of deep anguish to the young boy. Unable to contain his sadness, Shoba cried unrestrainedly again. Time passed, and the world outside continued its course. Indifferent to a single human's grief, Shoba was slowly coming to terms with this harsh reality. Nobody cared. Only his family ever had. He drifted in and out of sleep until the skies outside darkened again. Upon waking up from another nightmare-induced sleep, he felt a sharp pain throbbing against his head, his mouth dry, and his throat uncomfortably itchy. Unaware of how long he had been in such an uncomfortable position, his body ached from the stiffness when he tried to move his limbs. As the outdoor light faded, the interior of the two-story apartment was plunged into an eerie darkness. Shoba's sniffles filled the quiet space as he finally shuffled free from the cocoon-like embrace he had created for himself. He tried to lift himself from the ground but, unsurprisingly, felt too frail to muster the strength needed for the movement. Shoba angled his arms on either side of his seated posture, attempting to stand. Yet, time and again, he staggered and collapsed back onto his backside. He was too weak, too stiff, 
and too tired mentally. A mocking smile creased his sullen face, understanding he had been the architect of his current plight. Maybe I should eat, he thought to himself. It wasn't a suicidal tendency. He just didn't know what else to do right now. Since the disaster, he had unconsciously turned to the news channels every hour, which were filled with sad stories and recounts of that fateful night from various sources. Initially, the images broadcasted worldwide were too horrific for Shoba to comprehend at first. He replayed the scene of his mom being sucked into the vortex, her disheveled face, blood trickling from the side of her mouth, along with her final words. Shoba's chest tightened again remembering that. He clutched his damp clothes and closed his eyes tightly, wishing away the nightmarish images flashing through his mind. Please stop. I just want it all to stop, he whimpered, feeling warm tears slowly trickling down his cheeks again. He managed to overcome the wave of sadness that threatened to render him completely helpless for another night. But his hunger had reached a point where it could no longer be ignored. Shoba ended up crawling across the floor towards the kitchen, contending with the shattered glass and debris still littering the floor from the night of the incident. In the darkness, and with his limited mobility, it seemed impossible to avoid minor cuts or kneeling on hard pieces of wood. Calculating the distance to the kitchen, he maneuvered across the ground like an eel until his aching arms could no longer support him. Upon entering the kitchen, Shoba smelled a foul odor. Initially, he thought it emanated from himself. He hadn't bathed in seven days and was under no illusion about his current state. But this smell was distinctly sour, like moldy food or something decaying. After crawling inside, he used the furniture to haul himself up onto shaky legs. He wobbled and nearly toppled several times, but eventually made it to the tall gray fridge in the corner. Inside, a colorful array of ready-made food, old fruits, dried vegetables, and Jared condiments greeted him. His eyes locked onto the bottled waters on the lower shelf like a thief catching the sight of gold. Instinctively, he grabbed a bottle, unscrewed the cap, and gulped down the cold liquid, squeezing the bottle with all his strength. He exhaled a satisfied, a sound it had been possibly three nights since his last drink of water, so the chilling sensation in his stomach after the first few sips was unsurprisingly very cold and a little painful. After crushing the empty bottle in his hand, he slid back down to the floor, resuming his previous prone stance, before he crawled back the way he came, towards his cocoon of comfort. This time, there seemed to be less debris in his path. Shoba realized that his eyes had adjusted to the darkness. He noticed things he had missed before, like his father's ornamented vase, miraculously unscathed, still seated on the windowsill. The more he looked at the horrible vase, the more he was surprised he only really noticed it now. Also, he suddenly realized there was a strange pattern of pink flowers and unknown golden symbols glazed against the vase. The symbols were slightly archaic and reminiscent of Norse runes of giants. What an ugly thing, he spoke inwardly. His gaze then fell upon a faux gold-framed picture. His heart shuddered as he recognized the image from August 19th, his 13th birthday. His dad had managed to book a rare period off work, so his parents had planned a day out at a natural animal resort, one of the few left on the continent. Those hazy memories stirred the slumbering sadness in his heart again. Shoba could still hear his mother's fading voice from her final moments. Be strong, my beautiful boy. He wiped away the tears trailing down his cheeks. His mind began to lapse into lamentation when a foreign sound suddenly echoed from the dining room. Shoba lifted his aching gaze in a hurry. A sizzling sound shattered the silence followed by a string of lights which sent a pang of fear swelling in his chest. Against the wall, a blue spark ignited and began to move anti-clockwise, tracing a large oval shape. Startled, Shoba instinctively shuffled back until his back met the firm wall. His eyes fixated on the phenomenon unfolding before him without blinking. Woo! The sound echoed as the trace of blue, formed a mirror-like substance within the oval shape. Shoba's first thoughts were simple. Had his parents come back somehow? Was this all a dream, and the conductor of this nightmare was just now appearing to wake him up? His eyes narrowed as he started to see a figure emerging from the shimmering liquid portal. That that's not mom, or dad, was his first thought. 
Draped in a multicolored robe adorned with violet and a range of warm colors, the hooded figure, standing at 5 feet 11 inches tall, removed its shawl away from its helm, revealing an enchanting visage to the world. Shoba was stunned and rather scared at the sight of this strange being. Before him stood a strange humanoid creature with a sharp and regally poised chin and a youthful oval face. His skin was strikingly a royal blue tint, whilst his thin lips were dark like blueberries. Its hair, snow white and silk woven, cascaded just past its shoulders. The eyes shone a striking magenta hue and bearing a cold expression as the fellow locked eyes with him. What captured Shoba's intrigue the most were the sharply pointed ears, sitting elegantly on either side of the being's face, spurning a single thought to cross his already disheveled mind state. Is that, is that an elf? Chapter 12 A. Mana Storm W.H. What R. Shoba mouth remained gaping wide, with his words stumbling out in broken gibberish. In truth, his words stood as a somewhat accurate representation of what his mind was currently going through at this moment. The majestically dressed figure slightly tilted its round face upon noticing the existence of the bewildered youth. It blinked its large magenta glowing eyes a few times before it sighed deeply, rubbing the bridge of its nose for a few moments before raising its helm again. Once its mouth opened a string of gentle and audible sounds flowed out. A look of displeasure appeared on its bizarre bluish face as it continued enunciating different inaudible sounds. Like a novice pianist searching for the starting key, Shoba very quickly realized the strange fellow was muttering a series of different languages one after the other. He was considered one of the top 10% of youth across the Asian Eastern continents. Since attending private schooling as a child, he was already well-versed in multiple dialects, so he caught a few familiar tongues during the bizarre ordeal. Soon enough, a familiar tongue sounded through the air. See, can you understand me? A clear and melodic voice spoke to him. At first, Shoba was still startled by the strange fellow's outward appearance, its sudden arrival, and now its soft, choral-sounding voice, almost not matching its cold exterior. The voice didn't seem to match the cold glint in his eyes. Although the figure carried an aura of maturity, its voice suggested someone not a day over 18. The situation was becoming increasingly bizarre. The mysterious fellow's brows narrowed, seemingly displeased with Shoba's initial silence. I said, can you understand me? It repeated less than friendlier this time. Ah? Why yes, I can a him. But WW, who are you? Shoba finally found the confidence to ask shakingly. The blue-skinned fellow's brows relaxed at the question. Pa, he replied indifferently. Po. Shoba echoed, a confused expression crossing his face. The fellow nodded then cast a gentle gaze around its new surroundings. So, this is the famed untouchable realm, HM? Doesn't feel all that majestic. One wonders what the higher-ups find so alluring about this place. It said with a slight disdain. Meanwhile, Shoba's thoughts drifted back to the events from seven nights ago. The appearance of those ominous, shivering portals came to mind widening his eyes as traces of anger and hope flickered through his already fragile state. Sigh. Why am I always delegated to these odd places anyway? Who did I offend to deserve this? The being called Pamuse to himself, wandering around the small-sized apartment without a care in the world. Shoba, still slightly stunned, quickly regained his composure soon enough and rose to his feet in a flash. Ashi, What exactly are you looking for? And who are you? Why are you in my home? His voice, fueled by a surge of emotions, carried a reprimanding tone, surprising both him and Poor. Rather than reacting to the tone, the blue-skinned visitor studied the distressed youth before him more intently. This led to an awkward, drawn-out pause. Shoba maintained his frail balance, refusing to shift his piercing gaze from the visitor. He wanted answers, the truth, and most importantly, he wanted to see his family again. Pa studied the boy in the damp room with a careful, expressionless gaze. Yet, there was a hint of deep thought within his oval magenta eyes whilst he sized Shoba up and down. Suddenly, politely clapped his palms together as if he had solved a great conundrum. Swiftly, he lowered his hand and retrieved a peculiar black metallic ball, 
about the size of an apple, covered in bright silvery veins. Pa measured his throw before lightly tossing the weighted ball into the air. Shoba stepped back in a hurry, fearing the heavy-looking object might damage his floorboards. Miraculously, the ball never dropped. It stopped at eye level with Pua. Odd clicking sounds from the fellow then ensued, which instigated a series of beeps and tiny whirring noises from inside the metallic ball. The silver veins began to glow and pulse, and then it sprang to life, with two ethereal wiry wings unwrapping themselves away from the onyx shell. Shoba stood motionless, marveling at the floating metal ball as it excitedly whizzed around Poe's head like a firefly. Poe flailed his arms a few times, failing to swat the flying black ball away in annoyance. That's enough. Stop it. Stop. Damn. Golem. Viraltius. Viraltius. I say. His desperate calls finally evoked a response. The metallic ball ceased its erratic flight and gently settled beside Poe's shoulder. He sighed in relief before his stern gaze returned to Shoba again. You mortal me. God. A sinister smile creased his dark blue lips after he said that. Shoba felt a chill crawl down his spine watching that chilling smile. Just as he was about to speak, Pa burst into a cackling laughter that filled the entire apartment. Hey, now, why such a serious expression? I thought mortals were more intuitive with matters of jest. Ahem, to clear the clouds in your thoughts, let me explain a few things. Go on, don't be afraid, take a seat. Shoba studied the fellow for a few moments. He didn't seem scary or a threat on the outside. There was even a tiny part of him that felt rather intrigued by him. My name is Polaris Thasselmoritan IV, and the 64th child of the great and benevolent Helvetio Sama. You may call me Sir Pur, of course, he declared proudly, chin slightly raised. Where I come from doesn't concern the fleeting thoughts of mortals like yourself. Why I am here, however, opens the door to an interesting conversation. Where shall I begin? Ah, of course, the mana storm seven days ago. Mana storm? He repeated to himself. Shoba mentally stored the words, setting aside the mixed feelings in his heart for now. He realized this might be his best chance to understand the catastrophe. Somehow he felt like a golden egg had fallen into his lap. He needed to listen more and speak less, a vital lesson his father had instilled in him from a young age, and a rather automatic response with the way his mind worked naturally. Per inspected the youth carefully before continuing, nodding slightly, seemingly impressed by Shoba's swift change from his earlier agitated demeanor. It's quite complex to explain the mana storm without delving into the fabric of dimensional roads, the shape of the galactic map, and the intricacies of interdimensional time rifts as a whole. Simply put, the arrival of the mana storm's devastation upon your world had also brought forth the appearance of time rifts. My job is to monitor these rifts and devise countermeasures to prevent such devastations from continuing. Unfortunately, your world, Earth, VXC-77, lies outside the United Eight's maps. Had this disaster not occurred, my species would have no reason to be here. Shoba's heart pounded in his chest, his face slick with cold sweat whilst his mouth slightly parted, allowing heavy breaths to escape. Logically, what he was hearing sounded like a fantasy, a hoax, or a poorly written conspiracy, but after the week he'd endured, he couldn't deny anything anymore. A small fire of hope ignited in his broken heart. His voice trembled as he mustered a feeble question. These time rifts, where do they lead? And, can I bring someone back? He swallowed his nerves before continuing. Can I find someone who was taken by one? Poe's eyes momentarily widened. Oh ho, so you've lived through the mana storm. Perhaps my coordinates were correct this time around. Dula, initiate sequence reversal. Seven days, six hours, 47 minutes, and hm. 0.32 seconds ago should be enough. The metallic ball emitted a shrill noise, signaling its understanding of the command. Its delicate wings fluttered wildly as a red light emerged on its front, projecting a translucent beam that scanned across the darkened living room. Shoba slightly tensed up as the red beams passed through his body, experiencing what seemed like a high-speed laser scanning the entirety of the entire room. Moments later crimson shapes began to form around him, creating laser models of his house. 
He watched in odd fascination as the beams passed through him, noting his position at the edge of the mahogany table that dominated the dining area. Shoba traced the contours of the table, observing his walls, windows, ornaments, and all the broken items shimmering into existence under a crimson static energy. It was both masterful and terrifying to watch. His eyes widened in horror as two life-sized human figures, rendered in red static, appeared around the table. Mom, did that. Retreating a few steps until his back met the familiar wall he had leaned against for days, Shoba's mind teetered on the edge of helplessness whilst he watched these crimson models recapturing what he soon realized was a previous time before the disaster. He closed his eyes, whispering to himself, It's not real. It's not real. Upon reopening his heavy eyelids, he saw the scene transforming once more. The red lights had reconstructed the events of seven days prior. While there were no audible voices, just static pops and sounds, the scene unfolded silently but more so performed with complete accuracy down to the finest detail. Shoba found himself standing next to the blue-skinned visitor, both watching the red energy replay the day that haunted his mind. The crimson models, though lacking the actual definition of his parents, captured their mannerisms to their minute detail. Shoba's mind briefly wandered to the possibilities of such advanced technology. His brows furrowed as he stole a prolonged look at the unwelcome visitor, reminded of the ongoing obscurities unraveling in his once peaceful world. This is incredible. But who is he? He questioned himself wearingly. Until the beginning of this week, Shoba had lived a peacefully mundane life, filled with achievements, family, and friends. Now, his world no longer made sense, and he sensed that something far bigger was at play. Feeling Shoba's intense gaze, Pa turned his head slightly. Mana constellations. Only high-grade tools like this one can harness particles in this way. Oh, and surprisingly, your world is filled with countless particles. It's quite bizarre, considering I read that a mana vein couldn't exist in this realm. Hmm, how strange this place is indeed. Shoba mulled over the word mana in his thoughts. If his understanding of the fictional substance held any truth, then this energy was the natural source of power that wizards or magicians used to produce incredible attacks. His voice emerged involuntarily, crackling with curiosity. Are, are you a wizard? He asked gently, but turned his head towards the boy, his soft purple face momentarily displaying a flicker of emotion before returning to its usual cold glare. A wizard? What do you know about wizards, mortal? Humph. Posnorted. I am someone whose title transcends such a common classification. You see this? He gestured towards the alluring silver staff in his hand. Its ruby, diamond-shaped jewel glittering like crystallized blood. These three silver stars here. Only those chosen by the deity core receive this. Then, with a brazen motion, he firmly knocked the staff three times against the ground. Shoba took a cautious step back as the surrounding red models grew volatile. He saw the appearance of those whirring portals take shape in the form of an amber color. He was once again witnessing the final moments of a lone figure being pulled into a portal. The room was engulfed in seconds, followed by another silent, human-like model entering the lifeless scene of sadness. Shoba's heart tightened, and he clenched a fistful of his damp clothes his eyes brimming with a mix of fury and helplessness, re-watching the scene of his mom being taken again under his watch. My mom, my family. They were pulled into those things, he said coldly, pointing towards the shimmering oval particles devouring the crimson world. Where are they? Pa furrowed his brows, feeling an unexpected unease for half a second from the boy's glare. The portals took them? Hmm. Well, that is quite an interesting problem. You see, a him. Due to no fault of my own nor my superiors, a very important relic, which is of no concern to your world, has been stolen. Well, I should say this certain something was guarded by an all-powerful protector. A him, and this protector was murdered recently, causing an unnatural stir in the life-giving cosmos. Pa directed his even gaze toward the amber particles. The whole point of this protector is to ensure the flow of time between the Sea of Realms remains stable, for obvious reasons. So, the worlds don't fall or collide? Shoba said daringly, 
his words emerging almost unconsciously. For some strange reason, these things were slowly making some sense to him. Shoba had already tuned his intriguing mind to take in everything, regardless of how confusing or disbelieving it all was, to know more about the disaster. He had already deduced he had to adopt a new approach to how he viewed everything. Almost like a baby learning how to talk again. Pia, genuinely surprised by this insight, nodded in agreement before continuing. Sigh, you can imagine the traffic it's caused for my department. There are over 52 portal rifts connected to countless places far beyond what you mortals perceive as stars. We're already stretched thin trying to safeguard these rifts. And the fisherman... The great being who guards those rivers was taken out. Erg, but at least my journey is almost over. Hey, did you ever see a different kind of portal? How should I put it? A sort of, prettier portal, perhaps? Shoba thought long and hard about that. His eyes suddenly flashed wide remembering exactly what the purple fellow could be asking. Ah? Uh? I? My sister? She walked into a brighter one. It wasn't like the others. Shoba's voice trailed off into a hiccup his teeth grinding against each other whilst he tried not to remember Ringo walking away with that angelic figure. Pa glanced down at the boy's clenched fists, noticing droplets of blood trickling onto the carpet from how hard he was clenching. Pa felt an urge to say something but stopped short, his eyes widening as he pondered Shoba's words. Oh, so there was one living in this realm? I see. Wait, what do you mean by there was one? Shoba demanded his tone growing more insistent. Puh, perceiving the boy's escalating agitation, chose to overlook the rudeness. Unlike the one your parents fell into, he explained calmly, still attuned to Shoba's rising emotions. Fell into? They were taken. Shoba enunciated each word with growing intensity. His bloodshot eyes narrowed, resembling a provoked beast glaring at the composed, blue-skinned figure before him. Easy now, little cub, they were, unfortunately, claimed by what we term wild rifts. The sheer force of these rifts indicates the unstable nature of the realm at the other end of their current. In contrast, the more aesthetically pleasing portals, which we call controlled portals, are intentionally created to facilitate communication with other worlds. And for operating such portals, one requires one of these at least, the Kaxalu. He gestured towards the staff in his hand. Chapter 13 An Evening Spent with Pooh So, what you're saying is, my sister was P purposely taken. B but why? The notion sounded ludicrous to Shoba at first, but the more fragments of memories he tried piecing together from that night, the clearer Poe's words became. During disasters of this magnitude, rather than letting a terrible ordeal wreak havoc, deities, or the masters of the spheres, Utilize the emergence of an unstable yet shallow current to create gentler portals across the worlds. While the primary reason for this is relatively straightforward to grasp, why not search for an opportunity in moments of disaster? The underlying motive is a little more complex. It involves seeking out a select few individuals, blessed with what we call higher spiritual essences. These unique energies resonate with these particular deities and thus they are sought after as trophies and brought across the galactic roads into new worlds, where they are trained or a hymn. Best to not think about the other option, he said shifting his eyes a little before he cleared his throat. Poe's still face never changed as he mouthed the next sentences clearly. Fledglings are chosen by outer forces or the hidden ones, and in much rarer cases the divine benevolent itself. Who can truly say why that is? considering it's against one of our laws to interact with beings outside of our reality. But I guess, sometimes the strong do things just because they can. Of course, these chosen are presented with a choice to venture into a new world it's never by force. Your kin merely agreed to the demands of the being which approached her, therefore you should see it as dash. Liar. A sudden roar yelped from the bosom of Shoba. His entire body was shaking whilst he fought back the impulsiveness to throttle the relaxed blue fellow. Pa merely raised a brow at him for a brief moment. Ringo would never, she would never abandon her family. Imam. And Dedad. She just wouldn't. His chest felt heavy, his mind burdened as never before. 
Too many dark and depressing thoughts were swirling with a torrent of unresolved questions and emotions spilling over all at once. How is that possible? Ringo would never do that, would she? Ding. Patap the staff gently against the ground. The metal rebounded off the floor smoothly, as if it had brushed against the surface of water. But even more peculiar was the sudden lightness Shoba experienced, followed by a euphoric haze that nearly lulled him into sleepiness. You're disturbing my story, mortal. Lest you forget, I am the one showing mercy to a being destined to not remember a single thing once my mission is done here. Shoba felt his heart tense again hearing those words. W, what is he talking about? He queried himself with rattling eyes. Forget? W, H, why would I forget? He muttered stiffly into the dark air. Pa began to feel uneasy. He looked at the distressed young man with a solemnity that contradicted his impassive stare. He had forgotten how different mortals were from the beings he usually associated with. Mortals were emotional bags of flesh. Quite intriguing and most certainly harder to carefully gauge. Observing the boy's fear manifesting as beads of cold sweat, Pasai disapprovingly once more before turning his attention back to the floating silver ball, which beeped continuously as it concluded its designated task. The room's temperature seemed to have dropped sharply. Shoba quickly became aware of the change in his environment as he felt an intense cold seeping into his bones. In truth, it's too soon to tell. 75% of mortals don't survive being pulled into those chaotic rifts. Only the fortunate ones, possibly the young and yes, those with a hidden sense of high spiritual awareness, might make it. Your parents might be alive, or perhaps they won't, but the harsh reality is that you may never be able to discover the truth. Poe's expression darkened significantly. He gripped his staff tighter, and Shoba sensed an impending threat. Now I can confirm that a fledgling was secured from here. My task is complete. With that, Pa tapped his staff against the empty air behind him. Suddenly, like paper being torn, a rift opened in the air again. A grayish pale, shimmering portal emerged, expanding as if driven by its force, or perhaps by Poe's will. Shoba was overwhelmed with an influx of thoughts as he watched the silver portal fully unfold again. Wait. Why won't I remember anything? What are you going to do to me? And how can I get my family back if I can't remember? Shoba's panic escalated, sensing that something dreadful was imminent. Hey, haven't you been listening? You're not strong enough to navigate the myriad spheres where they might be. If they're even alive, Per retorted. Then, how do I become? Bah, let me finish. Yes, K. The dossier was right about your kind. You mortals never listen. Listen closely now. Under the laws of the great Helvetios, only members of the Els faction, like myself, and chosen youths scattered across the nebulous sea, the fledglings, like your sister, are allowed to know the true secrets of the vast realms beyond your skies. To us, your world is merely a speck in a vast desert of realms. To draw a more vivid picture, we've likely only explored a fraction of the countless worlds woven into the fabric of space and time itself. There isn't enough resources to know every strange realm out there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Only the strong can do what it is you wish to be done. As Shoba listened, a blend of understanding and resigned powerless acceptance began to form in his mind. Ha ha ha, well, this has certainly been quite the adventure. For me, that is. You, on the other hand, well, you have endured far too much emotional turmoil, especially for someone so young. Aha, impressive, right? I've studied quite a bit about mortals' emotions and whatnot. Ah, Helvetio Sama would be proud of me. He sang with stars practically glittering within his gaze. What the hell is he babbling about now? And this Helvi, this person, is he the leader or some kind of god? W, would he be able to help me instead? Shoba wondered to himself trying to think and find anything to pull him out of this situation. As Shoba raised his head slightly, his lips beginning to form a question, Pa seemed to have anticipated his curiosity. With a graceful gesture, Pa raised a finger to his nose bridge and gently tapped it before he began to explain. We else are particularly attuned to what you mortals call endorphins, and indeed to all forms of energy that your species emits. From the moment I arrived, I could sense every nuance of your sadness. 
Your species has a unique relationship with emotions and the ethereal energies that flow through the cosmos. It's possible that your distinctiveness arises from this very connection. Shoba listened with a growing, burgeoning interest. The notion of gods, otherworldly realms, and the vast cosmos unfurled a mix of tension and deep fascination within him, awakening this dormant drive that his sadness was trying hard to suppress. Or was it the guilt? Shoba found it roughly ironic, considering he had always wished to see beyond the mundane veil of his world. Only, at the price of what he had lost, was it truly what he desired at heart now? He realized that had he not been thrust into the heart of such turmoil, the encounter with the extraterrestrial entity known as Pa might have even sparked a sense of longing for fulfillment. Now then, guess it's time I wiped your memories. Po declared nonchalantly. Shoba felt a sudden cold chill rushing through his body. He knew this fellow wasn't bluffing. His instincts, dulled by the weight of depression, were beginning to sharpen once again. Only the strong have the right to dictate the paths of fate. So forgive me as I bid you farewell and goodbye. Pa ceremonially intoned, raising his staff above his head. No! Shoba cried out in panic, surprisingly halting Poe's movements in place. Wait w wait before you do it. Promise me this. Promise me you'll look for my parents. Please I need you to do that. My last wish before I forget all of this, before I forget them, he please? He heard his own voice choked between his whimpers. What else could he do but beg? He was weak, confused, and lost in all of these strange notions about worlds, portals, and gods. Hmm, a promise. Uh, pa looked to be seriously wrestling with the idea, although he knew it was pretty pointless to promise something to someone on the verge of forgetting all about this matter he had learned today. On the other hand, what most didn't know about Pua was how he had been studying humans for quite a while during his leisure time. And one thing he would never admit to anyone was the deep-rooted fascination he found learning about the behaviors and actions of the interesting mortals from this famed place called Earth, where Pua comes from they call Earth the secret plane amongst the worlds. Of course, most of this Shoba was not privy to know about, but it was because of these things that kept Pua idly chatting to him thus far. Most he else would have inspected the area, performed the memory-bending sequence, and left without so much as a hello and bye. But Pa himself understood the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity he had been here. He merely had to openly act as though he wasn't secretly ecstatic to be here. After all, he knew he was being watched by Helvetios at all times. Shoba, on the other hand, had very quickly made a bold claim to himself. Pa was intrigued by this world or by him. His expressionless gaze was a smokescreen to the words of wonder flowing through his purple lips, and something told him there was a subtle chance of hope within that truth. Thankfully, his intuition proved to be right this time. Watching those magenta-colored irises wrestling with thought, he knew this strange alien held no interest of leaving so soon. I can't make that promise. However, I will do some digging into potential areas where those who gave you life were taken too. I'm not too sure if that'll provide you some sort of solace. But rules are rules, I'm afraid. Shoba lowered his eyes, and with a faint voice, he could only utter a single word in response. Oh. Per attempted to convey firmness, crossing his arms while tapping his index finger against his bicep. However, his inner thoughts betrayed his outward demeanor. Despite the whirring portal behind him, he couldn't help but feel drawn to the sudden shift from hope to disappointment evident in the child before him. He yearned to delve deeper, to understand just how much mortals invested their hopes in their kin, why their emotions were so damn chaotic, and where this strange fascination came from. Why does the divine baby these creatures? What makes them so special? After all, if a fledgling had already been received from this plane and the deity had no involvement in the process, this would prove to be a tedious affair for him. Handling Earth, a place considered so mysteriously crafted, was a task any one of his people would have eagerly embraced. But could already envision the extensive notes he would need to scribble across endless pages once he reported back. His afternoons would be consumed by these laborious tasks for a while, meaning he held less time to play. The mere thought of it left a lump stuck in his throat. Clearing his hoarse throat, Per endeavored to maintain the demeanor of a shrewd officer on the outside, 
Whilst on the inside, he was secretly devising a plan that would ensure he could stay here a little longer. H. Hey, how about I stay here for a short while then? I mean, there's a great deal of splendid conversation to be had. A about the rifts. You're, can I suppose? Shoba was a little surprised by Poe's sudden change in demeanor. He did sense there was a curious childlike aura around the fellow, though it was hard to discern a clear picture from the blue fellow's attitude mostly. Shoba could somewhat see intrigue drawn across those expressionless eyes at times, but it was so subtle he wasn't confident enough to bank on his hunches at this point. There wasn't much he could do right now. His best option was to stall for time in hopes but held a change of heart about wiping his memories. Eventually, Shoba agreed with a soft head nod, drawing Purr to place his glittering white staff down, and then he sat adjacent to Shoba and crossed his legs ceremonially. So, what shall we talk about first? Pa asked gently. Shoba felt a little nervous being glared at by those cold magenta eyes. But he quickly steadied his nerves, took a deep breath, and smiled crookedly towards the expectant visitor from a faraway land. Okay, F first of all. Have you heard about Dango? The evening drifted by, and the eagerness of nightfall fell upon the busy eastern Tokyo wards. Neon signs mixed in with the vibrancy of colorful lights left the dark skyscrapers of Tokyo glowing beneath the twilight skies. In truth, since the disaster took place life continued, and people were starting to flock back outside whilst the nationwide state of emergency was slowly being lifted. Shoba finally drew apart his blinds and pried open one of the sealed windows. The cold air walked in, and he shivered slightly taken aback by the sudden feel of the outdoor air after almost eight full days. Per remained seated in the same position. He was pondering the numerous things he had engaged in discussions over, the popular festivals, the new moon, and some of Shoba's favorite delicacies. What seemed to cause a sparkle within his glittering violet iris was the intriguing history of Japan's ancient imperials. Pa was studying all the things he had learned, creating this current four minutes of awkward silence between them. Shoba didn't mind it, considering he too was busy wrestling with the little he understood and yet mind-blowing secrets Pa had explained to him about this growing universe. He enjoyed the time to go over the mind-blowing things he was told. The great crisis between worlds was known as the Mana Storm. Rift portals, which in modern terms were corridors of highly radioactive energies interlocking unnatural gateways between the distant worlds. This explains why Pa mentioned to him the reason a few among billions of mortals are called upon to enter a place he quietly referred to as the Crystalline Palace, where the Chosen would almost be auctioned among the eight great worlds. Each time Pa unintentionally revealed some secrets about the world he came from, he would always use the excuse, you won't remember this anyway, as a method to justify his clumsy actions. Time dutifully passed on. Pa thumbed his chin for a little, before exhaling a relaxing breath. Thank you. This was surely informative. He spoke making haste to rise to his feet. Watching his slender movements, Shoba felt his heartbeat hasten. His eyes never left the peculiar silver staff, affixed with that blood-red ruby jewel floating in the middle of the lunar-shaped helm of the staff. The sight of that bleeding jewel drew a cold sweat against the nape of his neck, but also a thought of intrigue. On more than one occasion he had seen Pa use it to conjure a portal. Perhaps he could. Shoba felt a surge of euphoria rush through his veins, and his mind finally began to awaken. Problem-solving had never seemed so arduous to him before. His past teachers had always praised the unique ways he tackled various problems, and the tactfulness he used in situations whenever the door seemed closed. Now, more than ever, he needed his distinctive mind to work a miracle. The next few moments were crucial. They would determine whether he could retain his memories or forget everything. His dad, his mom, and even Ringo. Chapter 14. Helvetios, the Guardian of the Sphere. Shoba understood the portal was likely linked to that palace Po mentioned before, where that supposed god lived. Although Po was very careful and meticulous with the things he shared, Po was clearly not a human being and that truth showed itself during the course of their interaction. Shoba could piece together several flaws in Poe's explanations or attempts to present a facade, most of which appeared when discussing the matters concerning that palace and the so-called god who ruled it. 
Whilst they continued to discuss any random thing Shoba could think of, he couldn't take his eyes away from that shimmering portal against the wall, more so than the impending threat of his memories being wiped away. Was he prepared to just sit here whilst his parents were erased from his existence? All the memories he shared with them, the love and the funny times, was that all to be done away with? No. And never. Shoba clenched his fists tightly, his knuckles whitening with the force of his grip. He felt the wounds against his palm from before. His nails had made cuts and drew blood from his frustrations. Strangely enough, he didn't feel pain anymore. He kept his head bowed for a moment before slowly lifting it, consciously masking any sign of anger or betrayal from his expression. Meanwhile, Po was engrossed in a book about the diverse cuisines of Japan, a gift from Shoba, who thought he'd no longer need it. Po's fascination with mortal food had been piqued ever since he discovered the cooking section on the tall bookshelf standing in the front room, and he had been completely absorbed by it for almost a few hours now, until the noise from the portal behind him snapped him back into reality. Right, that should be that then, he couldn't help feeling a sense of pity as he watched the dejected youth before him lowering his gaze. Pa understood what erasing the memories entailed, in short, it wasn't a process that settled well in the hearts of mortals. A lot of them had a knack for one day remembering these thoughts, some even turned insane because of them. Pa had researched countless texts concerning mortals, and one clear-as-day truth about them revealed just how fragile their minds were. Orders are orders. He spoke solemnly to himself, smoothing the silver strands over his head, whilst he tried not to get attached to the mission at hand. Pa handled the silver staff in his grasp once more. The ruby jewel glittered like a bloody eye. Shoba stared in anguish at the glaring jewel. He felt it peering into the very fabric of his being. Such an odd sensation each time he glared directly at that part of the staff was troubling. It was as though something unworldly was calling out to him. Shoba steadied his breathing and softly shut his eyes. Was there truly no escaping this fate? Shoba refused to accept it, but in the same breath, he didn't know what to do. Pa held out the staff and uttered a string of strange words. The red jewel started to glow. The staff shook violently within Poe's grasp and the blue-skinned fellow shut his delicate eyelids himself. His brows and lashes were snow white, flying away from his skin like a majestic pale feathered bird. Shoba softly opened his gaze and took a lasting look at the fellow. He was beautiful within all sense of the word. Feeling the sweat on his brow, Shoba gathered his strength and stood up gingerly. Hey, Pa, W, wait, he called out defiantly once more. Huh, Pa responded, caught off guard by Shoba's interruption again. As Pa opened his eyes, he was met with the sight of a disheveled and sweaty Shoba, who was pointing at something with an almost manic grin plastered against his face. Be before you go. There's a book you in in an EED to take with you a book filled with all the dreams and wonders of our world. It contains all the tastiest dishes and desserts. I wish for you to take a look at it before you leave, Shoba stammered, his ugly smile unwavering whilst hurried breaths continued to escape through his lips. Pa looked at the boy with confusion for a moment, but soon gave a soft nod of agreement, seemingly charmed by the proposition. With deliberate, measured steps, Shoba moved towards the bookshelf in the corner while Pei watched from a distance. Shoba approached the aged shelf where his family, mostly his dad, kept most of their favorite reads. The shelf was in disarray, with many books either misplaced or scattered on the ground following the recent turmoil. He scanned the remaining titles, their spines barely discernible in the dim light. With the persistent sound of the portal humming in the background, Shoba knew he had to remain focused and careful with his next move, with his heart racing there was no margin for error. It's H here, look. His voice sounded almost pleadingly. Poe was none the wiser and very casually appeared beside him, bringing his face closer as he gazed deeply at the row of books through the partial darkness. Shoba had seen a book like the one he described to P.A. before at some point, and by his lucky stars that book was still here. H.M., this one? I see, I see. Well, there's no harm in taking a little look. But don't think I am oblivious to what you're trying to do. Wasting time will not erase the inevitable. I am bound by law to carry this out. Per reminded him, whilst eagerly opening the book and delving his eyes into its colorful pages. 
Despite Poe's stern words of conviction, the moment his fingers took hold of the book, he instantly buried his eyes into its contents with quickness, his solemn gaze flickering with a mixture of delight and intrigue. Shoba even noticed him swallowing a few times whilst he admired the images of all the different famous Japanese dishes. Now the book being quite wide and full made it somewhat uncomfortable to be merely held with one hand. Shoba locked onto Poe's movements with an eagerness, anticipating his second hand would arrive to support the book in due course. Time felt as though it had slowed down, whilst Shoba felt as though his attention was at the very highest of its peaks at this moment. He could feel the tension writhing through his bones whilst sweat clung to his body. His heartbeat thrummed so loudly he was scared Poe could hear it. But then, it finally happened. Amidst the swirling chaos of his inner thoughts, Pa needed a second hand to support the book, and in doing so set the majestic silver staff down in the process. A glint of something sinister flashed across Shoba's eyes. Without wasting a single moment, he took a few slow paces back and stalked around Poor until he was directly behind him, making no sound as his feet caressed the glass-covered floor. He felt the sharp pieces piercing his bare foot. In response, Shoba bit his bottom lip until they bled. One, two, breathe. He closed his eyes and centered himself. Within the deep pits of his swirling thoughts, he could see their faces again. Their smiles continued to haunt him, squeezing his heart free of any form of peace. He opened his dreary gaze and clenched down hard. With his entire might, he charged forward and knocked into the back of Poor. The poor fellow was completely caught off guard and rather comically was tossed right into the tall bookshelf with such force that the aged thing collapsed through its middle and fell forward, pinning the helpless traveler to the ground. Shoba stood there in complete disarray, his breaths exhaling forth rapidly as he placed an unsteady palm against his chest. The reality of his actions suddenly hit him. He tossed his gaze towards the silver relic, ran towards it, and took it in his grasp before he spun on his heels and ran as fast as he could for the portal. With a leap of faith, he plunged into the light, leaving behind the world he knew. Shoba could hear the world around him finally falling into a peaceful embrace. The hot air rippled slightly. Then he was doused by a sensational cool breeze. The air felt so cold his laborious breaths formed blue clouds into the space just away from his eyes. The moment he sensed the world had become still again, his eyes steadily opened. Shoba caressed his heavy lids. A faint blur marred the true understanding of where he was, though by the dark and bright colors swirling around, he was certain this was no longer home. Steadily his vision cleared as a deep gasp escaped his mouth soon enough. What the hell is this place? He mouthed in wonder. The world around him had changed, just as Pa had described it would be beyond the veil. Shoba's breath caught in his throat as he beheld the grandeur of a strange and wide hall that lay before him. The sheer magnitude of this place was staggering, leaving him momentarily awestruck as he couldn't believe the sight scaling around him. His gaze swept downward, only to recoil in fright at the sight that greeted him. The floor beneath him gleamed with a radiant blue luminescence, fashioned into countless diamond-shaped panels that stretched as far as the eye could see. The clarity of the glass was such that Shoba could almost discern a perfect reflection of himself within its surface, as though the floor was fashioned out of a watery mirror. He next moved his gaze towards the towering pillars, dwarfing his entire being, a gentle reminder that he was somewhere he couldn't fathom. For a fleeting moment, he entertained the thought that he had somehow shrunk within the confines of the portal. He craned his neck backward gazing up at the ceiling soaring hundreds of feet above him. The ceiling was shrouded in an ominous darkness that stirred almost like the clouds at night. Yet, amidst the overwhelming shock, a surge of erratic excitement coursed through him mingled with a profound sense of fear. This is what those extreme sports guys must feel all the time. He mused aloud trying to steady his pacing breaths. The rush of adrenaline bolstered his resolve. One minute he was standing in his familiar home, the next he was here. Wherever here was, it was somewhere he could only dream of seeing. He eventually found a steady rhythm. Turning around he noticed the shimmering aura of the portal through which he had passed had dissipated, leaving him with only one path forward. Come on Shoba, don't be scared. 
We have to move forward. With a deep breath, Shoba steeled himself for the journey ahead, determined to face whatever challenges lay in wait. As Shoba continued down the hall, the enormity of the surroundings struck him. The towering cedar pillars seemed to stretch endlessly upward, dwarfing him in comparison. He couldn't help but marvel at the craftsmanship and scale of the architecture as well, realizing that whoever constructed these halls must have been of a race much larger and more powerful than any he had encountered before. Recalling Poe's explanation about the existence of different worlds and the many races beyond his own, Shoba was beginning to piece together just how widely unknown most of the things outside Earth were to humans. The idea that there were beings unlike any he had ever known both intrigued and frightened the life out of him. I just hope whatever these beings are, they are at least friendly. He thought inwardly whilst trying not to imagine an all-powerful titan appearing. At times he couldn't stop twisting around, feeling something difficult to explain crawling against his shadow. It felt as though someone was watching him from someplace hidden. Despite the unsettling quiet and the feeling of being watched, Shoba pressed forward. Running or hiding would serve him no purpose. He needed to find someone powerful enough to help him navigate this unfamiliar realm and help him find his family. With each step, Shoba's reflection shimmered in the polished floor beneath him. Now that I think about it, didn't Poor mention something about some kind of supreme god? He called him Helv, damn it I can't remember. Shoba could only retain so much of what the swift-talking Pa had babbled on about. Under very different circumstances he might have enjoyed being seated beside Pa whilst he told him all about the great wonders of the world. Shoba felt a little guilty, Pa was captivated by earth foods and somehow he could find some understanding with that. Though I'd imagine that pushing him into a bookshelf and stealing his staff might have ruined any kind of friendship we could have had. He breathed a deep sigh through his lips. Shoba couldn't sit too long in those sad thoughts. He made a decision and was firm on standing by it. I need to find my family by any means necessary. He steeled his resolve again, making a small fist as he continued forward into the endless expanse of partial darkness. After walking for what felt like a very long time, Shoba held his heels right in the middle of the hall. He keeled over his hunched knees, breathing profusely whilst he stared aimlessly at the reflection looking back at him below. When he turned around he noticed he left footprints of blood. A wry smile appeared. At least he was almost certain to leave breadcrumbs for anyone who wanted to find him. Shoba unconsciously wiped his forehead. Huh. He was surprised by the amount of water on his hand. When did I start sweating this much? He asked himself whilst using his sleeves to wipe away the beads of sweat gathered against his forehead. He decided that within this partial darkness, he would use these brief moments to rest and plan his next move. Once he took a pause and searched his surroundings again, from his position, he could barely discern the outline of towering, arch-shaped twin doors formed along the distant dark walls to the side of this illustrious hall. Illuminated faintly by a soft glint emanating from a clear round dark stone set where one might expect a doorknob to be. He took a large gulp. Too big. Those doors are too big. Damn it. What the hell is this place? Resuming his aimless wander, Shoba hoped something awaited him at the end of this grand hall. Someone friendly. I've been walking endlessly. My breath. My legs. S so tired. Just when he was poised to take a longer break this time, something flashed ahead of his dreary gaze. About 100 meters ahead, a massive structure emerged from the deep darkness, which initially seemed to Shoba like a large complex, possibly the residence of a king within this gigantic hall. As he moved closer, however, he realized his mistake. The structure he had thought was a building revealed itself to be an enormous throne, akin to a titan in size and blending seamlessly with the Grand Hall's overall nightingale glassy decor. Shoba was awestruck by the throne's sheer size and craftsmanship. Unlike a dull and sinister black, the throne's color had a polished sheen, reminiscent of an onyx stone, enhancing its ethereal beauty. Stopping just before the throne's towering shadow, Shoba craned his neck all the way up, unable to take in the entirety of its form from this close. Am oh I God? That is way too big. Marvel very quickly turned into an unsettling thought. He feared the worst. Perhaps the appearance of a throne this size meant an even bigger problem lurked nearby to sit on it. 
This fear kept him constantly vigilant, peering around like a small animal on the lookout for predators, his knowledge of history reminding him that such dangers often lurked in the shadows nearby. Everything had been peaceful until then, but as Shoba had learned from the day's numerous mysteries and surprises, problems tended to emerge unexpectedly. Just as his heart somewhat found peace, Shoba took a hesitant step forward, crossing into the imposing dark shadow cast by this giant throne. Abruptly, a chilly, unfamiliar voice sliced through the quiet. Hello, traveler. Shoba gasped from shock and took a few steps back stumbling over his feet before he landed on his backside. He directed his quivering gaze toward the grand throne, finding it empty from an initial look. Yet, he was convinced that the eerie voice had emanated from that direction. Who, who the hell was that? Was I dreaming? Amidst the tumult of his thoughts, the voice intervened again, chiding louder this time. It's terribly bad-mannered when one fails to acknowledge a cordial greeting. It said ominously. As lightning cleaves through the gloom of a stormy night, the voice's reappearance renounced itself with a transformation in the shadows. Shoba squinted, discerning a form emerging from the darkness, a crimson cloak unfurling. Simultaneously, three orbs of white light descended from above, dispelling any of the shadows in its way and unveiling the entity that hovered before the throne. Shoba's eyes widened at the sight of the figure now clear in the light. He couldn't quite believe it until he rubbed his eyes a few times over. Towering and slender, it stood at an imposing height of eight feet, draped in a heavy crimson satin robe adorned with countless golden white stars against it. The figure's hands, sheathed in soft white gloves, were the only visible parts of its body, as its feet were concealed beneath the heavy robe. However, it was the head, or rather the lack of it, that captured Shoba's intrigue the most. A large spherical tank filled with clear water was replaced where one would expect to see a human head. More shockingly, Shoba saw the presence of tiny aquatic creatures swimming inside of it. The sight triggered a single word to flash through Shoba's mind. Air Alien. Chapter 15. Between the Spheres, Oaths and runes, Shoba POV. Naturally, how else could Shoba comprehend the vision before him? Most entities resembling the figure he now observed deeply were invariably labeled as aliens in his world. Your mind cannot possibly grasp what I am. You won't allow yourself to believe it, but the strange being spoke in a deep, hollow voice. With a sharp click of its gloved fingers, Shoba experienced an irresistible force wrenching the silver staff away from his grasp. Helplessly, he watched as an invisible force pulled the staff away from him before it floated gently toward the enigmatic figure suspended in the air. Polaris, my son, and this tool, Red Eyes Wheeler. Fufufu, it's a shame a boy as bright as he was dispossessed of such a pure relic. Such a shame indeed. It spoke, with a subtle regret lingering on its tone. The water in the figure's tank-like head swirled with each movement. Shoba found himself unable to remove his gaze away from the absurdity, lost in a deep sea of confusion and the very real feeling of fear mounting within his heart with every growing second. Calm down, Shoba, clutching his clothes around his chest. We've faced worse than this, just remember that night. He reminded himself trying his best not to become a stuttering mess in the presence of who he suspected was the supreme king Pa mentioned. Mortal one, I know what you seek. The voice heralded loudly like a king in an ancient movie Shoba had watched before. A chill ran through Shoba's entire body. Biting his lower lip, he maintained an impassive gaze as he fought every fiber within his body screaming at him to run. The floating figure snapped his gloved fingers again. This time the sound didn't reverberate as before. Instead, it transformed the silver-winged staff into a longer, golden one. The tall golden staff was adorned with a half-moon sickle and a sun melded together was twice the length of the previous one. A third snap conjured a sizable throne, draped in crimson and gold and floated behind the figure. The figure seated itself, elegantly crossing one hidden leg over the other. Shoba noticed it was wearing strange golden shoes with a theatric curl on the end. Shoba watched this bizarre display, a faint grimace crossing his face. What's the point of all this? He smiled weakly. Do not fear me. I foresaw your arrival today. 
Though only the chosen few may enter this realm, your actions merit great honor. Shoba, hearing this, thought of Pur, wondering if he'd be upset about being left on earth like that. A pang of guilt struck him. His mother would have scolded him for treating a guest, alien or not, in such a manner. Concern yourself not with Polaris, mortal one. Instead, use this time wisely. Ask me three questions that weigh upon your heart. I, Lord Helvetios, Grandmaster of one of the eight crystal spheres, promise to enlighten you. As he spoke, a life-sized hourglass filled with red sand materialized beside the spherical fishbowl head. The sand began to sift into the lower half, but for some reason, seeing that ignited a sense of dread deep inside of Shoba. A brief silence fell, but the glass-headed figure did not rush or speak again. Shoba, feeling the atmosphere's intensity, employed a breathing technique his father had taught him, a method developed in his childhood to manage high anxiety. After a 23-second breath, his nerves calmed a little and his eyes strangely felt clearer than they had ever been. My, ahem. My parents were taken by one of those re-read portals. Can, ahem. See, can you help me find them? His voice, though shaky, carried a firm resolve to it. An awkward pause ensued before he detected a soft exhale from the distant figure, who was still seated on the smaller floating throne, a gloved hand resting on the armrest. Your father? Your mother? Such strange and yet easy things you ask of a great being. Disappointing to say the least. But nonetheless, yes and no. Little mortal, how much do you grasp about life's fabric, about the powers within the cosmos? Your earth is a peculiar realm, after all, one so unique in its aloofness amongst the other worlds. The golden staff, inscribed with amber runes, began to glow fiercely with each softly spoken incantation. Shoba heard a faint crackle of lightning, then his gaze lifted to a constellation of lights forming a familiar globe directly above him, the planet Earth, a sight he had seen countless times in his world. Your Earth is perhaps the most unique among the over 70 planets mapped across our galactic realms. None can be deemed as special as Earth. Even my kin desire it, yet we all understand that its creator intentionally designed it to elude the grasp of beings like myself. Shoba envisioned a multitude of other fish tank headed entities, realizing he had uncovered a world altering secret. A secret to which countless scientists, researchers, and conspiracy theorists on Earth would possibly commit terrible acts to discover themselves. And yet here he was, a mere boy entangled in an extraterrestrial calamity, arriving at a truth many had long suspected. Earth was not alone. Frozen in fear, Shoba's emotions remained suppressed. He simply swallowed hard, unable to tear his gaze away from the levitating figure. Helvetios resumed speaking. Detailing the purpose of the Guardians would consume too much time. A commodity humans fear wasting, I imagine. So, I'll avoid lengthy discussions and focus on matters crucial for your understanding. The Grazdier Ventulos, or the Mana Storm Disaster, has disrupted the balance between the worlds and the rivers of time have been forsaken and polluted with the blood of the one who sailed across its celestial waters to protect it. Above Shoba, the holographic display shifted. He now observed various spheres floating amidst a dense sea, eight in total and not of water, but more like sand. Helvetios twirled his gloved finger, and illuminating arrows appeared within the holographic sea, thirteen in total, each pointing in a different direction. The display resembled an electrical circuit, or perhaps a kind of pathway as the sandy sea seemed to flow through each of the eight spheres. But with a deeper look he noticed the arrows only pointed one way. Forward. The arrows clarify the flow. And they represent realms guarded by my kin. And who are my kin? To mortals, you might refer to us as guardians, divine beings, protectors of the multiverses, or perhaps, game masters. An unsettling chuckle resonated in the air. Shoba felt a vibration around him, as though the very air itself was growling. Game masters? Shoba pondered wordlessly, as in, those people who preside over game lobbies? Tish, that can't be right. The direction of the flow indicates which dimensions have access to others. This design prevents us and our subjects from venturing into other dimensions at will, mainly to avert invasions and anomalies. Too many anomalies lead to disasters, 
and directly interfering with another GM's world was a forbidden act among us Game Masters. Every time Helvetios mentioned the term Game Masters, a wave of dread washed over Shoba. Are we merely pieces in their game? All the planets and the countless people existing across the world. Is it all just a game to them? His thoughts furrowed his brows as he wasn't sure why he felt so angry towards hearing all of this. Helvetios responded ominously, as though reading Shoba's thoughts. Yes, that is precisely how we must view it, as merely a game to us guardians, to the gods, and beings perched loftily in realms beyond comprehension. All things beneath them, all the things you chase endlessly, your ambitions, your goals, your hate, and your frail love, to beings dwelling in a higher plane. All these things are mere play. Those words left Shoba visibly stunned. He failed to hide to look of shock filling his rattling eyes as his mouth hung open. The longer the cosmos remain in chaos, the less chance you'd have in finding what you've lost. A look of distress noticeably appeared on Shoba's face. He suddenly felt all the repressed anxiety surging throughout his body again. W. Wait then. How do you do we stop it? H. How can I stop the chaos? His voice broke tenderly. It's simple. Master the art, the breath of the cosmos, and grow. Grow stronger, little mortal. For in our world of divine, that is the only way. The strongest will inherit the world as foretold to us long ago by the voices that welded the runes of power into existence. And what are the runes, you ask? They are the very fabric of life that binds us to the gods. The fishbowl head twirled his gloved fingers again. From his opened palms gently flowed a surge of sparkling golden dust, almost dancing on their own volition, forming a symbol likened to two feathers welded against an arrow with several strokes against its shaft. Take a look. This is a rune forged by power. The strange rune glittered with an ominous wonder in the air. Shoba could faintly see it was a strange thing made up of thousands of tiny golden particles crackling with a faint, incessive chirp, like millions of tiny screeching birds. To form such a rune, you must seek out the knowledge of the worlds, seek out the mysteries hidden within the cosmos, seek out the strongest of foes, and those creatures that claim to be the mightiest, seek them out one by one, and defeat them all. Shoba felt his heart rapidly pounding away. What's going on with me? He swallowed harshly, trying to maintain some level of clear-headedness amidst this inconceivable being. Although he felt incredibly terrified, there was something he couldn't ignore. Somehow, deep in his gut, with every word spoken, he felt a fire burning with excitement. To ascend to leadership, one must scale a mountain of adversaries, for it is only atop the mound of the valorous fallen that you can forge the mightiest rune conceivable, akin to the lords of yore. The champions and the judges, the game masters, Kukuku, do you think we have not all gone through it too? Of course. For how else can one obtain such power without defeating all who have approached this throne in a bid to snatch me off from it? Dear mortal, you have no idea what you are asking of me. To stop the calamitous ones, you must yourself be strong enough to control the calamity. Within that very moment, Shoba realized he truly understood very little about anything. He had once believed he possessed a somewhat mature perspective on the enigmatic gift of life. In fact, until recent events, he considered himself rather adept at navigating through it. However, the calamity of a single night had upended his entire existence and shattered his previous thoughts about life. Time beckons me to haste you with your third and final question. Using his white-gloved hand, he pointed towards the giant hourglass quickly sifting red sand into the lower chamber. Suda felt a strange wave of anxiety, crawling down his spine again, watching those tiny granules of red sand rushing down. What happens when the timer ends? Do I just go back to my world? Or worse? Mother. Ringo, father. Where are you? What about that strange being in white? Was that an angel? Or a devil dash? Too many variables still lingered in the air. But Shoba guessed there was only one real question he desired to know the answer to. Then. W. What happens once the timer stops? His childlike voice carried itself along the grand hall. Silence ensued for the first few moments, only the soft pattering sounds of the red granules hitting the bottom of the hourglass could be heard. Shoba stood there in a slightly anxious daze, 
The hourglass had almost filled the bottom chamber by now, and still, he heard no response from this strange and ominous being. And then, Ku, Kuku, Aha, Haha, He, Haha, Buaha, Haha, Haha. An almost sadistic laughter shattered the silence, and Shoba unconsciously took a few steps back in horror. Concern laden against his features, whilst he beheld the floating figure in the near distance, almost drowning in a cackling fit of laughter. His attention was torn between the sudden rupture of that crazed laughter sending chills through his bones, and that incessant pitter-pattering of tiny granules falling. Shoba felt a dreadful feeling. The feeling of powerlessness mixed with the sense of not knowing a single thing right now. Suddenly that image of being frozen in gray appeared. That chilling demonic smile from that red-eyed being surfaced. He clenched his two fists, feeling surges of panic, dismay, and loss, spurning a single emotion to finally come surging forth. Anger. Hey, tell me, why are you laughing? Answer me. Mortal. The voice thundered like an earthquake. Heck A.E.H., J. Just a simple mortal. Your final question should have been your first. But let's entertain it. Do you know why until this very moment you and your kind have never met anything from across the cosmos? It's simple if you think about it deeply. I they don't understand. Why would our world be purposely separated from the others? W. H. What's so different about humans? Whilst he searched for answers, he heard that heralding voice again overlapping his thoughts. Why are the beasts of the skies purposely made to never meet the beasts that dwell in the deepest reaches of the oceans? Because they were never made to stand in each other's realms. The sky beasts would drown, and the beasts of the seas would suffocate. Just like you mortal, you were never meant to ever step foot in this realm. Bwahaha. The moment Shoba heard that, before even a gentle sound could escape through his lips, he felt warm liquid rushing out of his nostrils. Shoba touched the dark carmine, staining his fingertips. Blood was falling, and a deep panic finally struck his heart. W.H. What's going on? Chapter 16 Between the Spheres, 2. A Deathly Accord Huh. The splatter of falling blood dotted the ground beneath Shoba's hazy view. Shoba felt a wave of nausea washing over him as his vision started to blur, quickly accompanied by a drain of weakness suddenly turning his bones into lead. A frightening chill crawled along the nape of his neck, with what felt like the genuine sensation of death clawing closer toward his fast-beating heart. Droplets of blood continued to fall, dotting the almost ethereal floor like carmine rain. The sheer shock of it all had rendered the boy who couldn't remember the last time he even grazed his knee, completely speechless as he idly watched blood pouring without any end. W.H. What? What is happening to me? Shoba could hardly process a steady thought. He soon lifted his helm towards the fishbowl head in the distance. The being remained unbothered, still seated on top of his throne maintaining an air of deep regal dominance. Shoba felt all the strength being drained away from his bones. A looming fear grappled dangerously around his heart as the dark mocking voice continued to fill his ears amidst his panic. The laws of time have already been set. A mortal cannot hope to survive ten minutes outside the fabric of your galaxy. After all, the air you rely on is different from the air within this space. To put it frankly, the moment you took your first steps onto these planes, his gloved hand gestured towards the hourglass which had practically a small amount of granules left to filter into the bottom chamber. This realm was already poisoning you. You have about a short few minutes before your body completely fails you. So I advise you to make peace with your god, dear, pitiful mortal. Blurk. Gukesh. An outburst of blood expelled out of Shoba's mouth as he made a frail attempt to shield it. Blood splattered against his two hands, causing his panic to worsen. Shoba heaved desperately for breath. His limbs croaked and left him staggering a few steps forward before he crumbled to the ground in a resounding heap. The very air he had once drunk greedily without worrying of losing it was now being sucked away from his lungs. His bloodshot eyes rattled with dread and confusion. The corners welled with warm tears. The greatest pain he was feeling settled within his mind. Shoba couldn't understand it, how or why this was happening to him. And not like this, I can't die. 
I can't. Mom, peel please. Someone he, help. In the fading moments of what felt like his entire life, tethered to his consciousness, Shoba fought desperately against the encroaching darkness drawing nearer to his heavy eyelids. The souring feeling of regret and loss plagued his heart bitterly. There was nothing else he could do but remember the fun days he spent with his family. Even the fights with his sister appeared like golden fragments that flashed across his mind like warm visions against the cold darkness. One by one, the memories he had thought were long lost were resurfacing in momentary drifting shards. I don't want this. I don't want it to die. Someone, anyone, save me, please. He cried with the voice nestled in his thoughts. His throat ached with a closeness that rendered his speech non-existent. Within the dimness of his eyes, Shoba vacant gaze beheld the distant hourglass looming with dread in the distance. The very last pieces of reddish sand finally filtered into the bottom chamber. Please, anyone, SSSA, V-E-M-E. -E. Mom, I'm sorry. Whilst he drifted into a soundless sleep, Shoba heard someone. A pleasant voice in the darkness. Good night, Shoba. Asterisk thrum. 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 Asterisk. The deathly sounds of bells toiled like the entrance to a funeral. A rumble likened to a titan's groan quaked against the ground, followed by the emergence of ghostly black shadows aligned against the walls. Their faces were a mask of pale bones, with a peculiar blue fire burning within their hollow eye sockets. They held up their gloved hands. Each one caressed a golden trumpet. One by one they all blew a vigorously sounding horn into the dark air. Kukukikia, dear mortal, rejoice. For I, the greatest realm master, Helvetios shall show mercy upon ye, the struggler from another realm. O oh, pitiful mortal, who by no fault of his own, had wandered into the realms forbade to his kind, O oh, shan I grant him grace. All hail the Lord. The shroud sang in unison. Such benevolent grace afforded to me by the divine? Shan I do it? All hail the Lord. Shan I show him mercy? Merciful guardian, supreme Lord. All hail the Lord. Rumble. The entire space rumbled with a terrible scourge. With the very faint remnants of consciousness Shoba held onto, the force vibrating across the ground sent small growls through his dying body. Suddenly those floating bright embers casting a partially bright light across the hall ceased, and a soothing cloak of darkness enveloped the entire grand hall in its place. The ghoulish shrouds lowered their helms, before retreating into the shadows again. A gentle bell chimed into existence, and a freckle of golden light, no bigger than a baby's fist appeared just above Shoba's sunken head, a small golden firefly suspended on the tip of an elegantly golden staff. Holding the golden relic's end was the ethereal Helvetios. No longer was he as tall as a towering oak, but smaller in size now, no more taller than six feet tall. He remained floating on an empty air just a few breaths away from Shoba's dying body. Dear mortal, his tone had become soothingly solemn now. Fear not, for I come with great tidings indeed. If you choose to accept, there awaits an odyssey filled with adventures across a string of cosmos, a life far beyond the reaches of what any mortal before you has ever seen. I come bearing an accord, but one with an undertaking, a vision I beheld, where the collision of worlds ushered in an age of calamity, one that may incur a great disaster upon our glorious cosmos. Therefore, I require someone to accomplish several tasks on my behalf, to mount a counterattack against the voracious fiends who dare to disturb the very fabric of time itself. Due to the laws of my kin, I myself cannot act so brashly. But, someone, unexpected perhaps? In my stead, cuckoo They think I don't see their faces, they lust for dominion. Deceivers, treacherous vermin, their treachery has slithered through the cosmos, a foul stench I can no longer tolerate. Thus, you shall act in my name and put an end to these calamities in my stead mortal. Here, I share with you great tidings indeed. To make things easier, he held out his gloved hand where a dark scroll unfurled out with a list of things written against it. 1. You must find the whereabouts of the lost fisherman. 2. And gather the tomes of Queen Lenara's eight children. 
the mighty Shinjin. 3. Slay the wicked witch of the northern road of chaos. 4. Obtain blood of the black-helmed quasi phyton dragon. 5. A tribute from the ghost master haunting Death Valley. 6. To acquire the third horn of the great demon king. 7. Kill Count Manduko's third son. 8. Obtain two pieces of Salad's golden ruin. 9. Discover the truth behind the ghost haunting Shadow Jin's village. 10. And lastly, Kukuk. I need my subjects to be empowered. 11. Locate and obtain Elder Roman Lifthwak's Wand of Misery. 12. Bonus. Obtain the Fragment of Time, hidden in the Princess of the North's Ring. Without strength, you cannot hope to accomplish even one of these tasks. Therefore, the Golden Scepter kissed the top of Shoba's head, and an omniscient glow shone as bright as the glowing sun penetrating the darkness. Shoba's brow slightly lifted before falling again his stiff fingers making the most delicate of movements despite his vacant, deathly gaze. You must become a king, in your own right. Ah, but of course, you can say no and completely fall into the void less pit of darkness. Your name, lost forever amongst the billions of ghosts within this world. So tell me, dear mortal, will you accept my accord or not? Shoba remained still, his face planted against the cold ground. The vacant look within his sight remained as cold as hollow bones. But then, in the deepest parts of himself, he heard the choruses of his memories. Their voices all converged upon him in a chaos of overlapping laughter and whispers. In a flurry of madness where he could hear hundreds of overlapping voices layered over the other, a final defiance pulsed throughout his entire body. A defiance against the rules of the world, against expectations, against his fears and anxieties, against the guardians, and against the tendrils of death itself. With the last remnants of life faintly flickering throughout his body, his eyes flashed open with a wondrous glint, and a verse broke free from the shackles of his dying body. Both his heart and soul resonated with an identical voice. Yes, yes, I want to live. A deep gasp breathed through his mouth, before his eyelids softly fell once more. Kukukuku, good, very good. Then I welcome you to the beginning of a new world. So Bakun. Buaha. Chapter 17. Awakening. Good morning, Rado Suta. Suta POV. The hazy blur distorting his vision finally cleared, and slowly the boy was beginning to make sense out of his newfound strange and somewhat foreign surroundings. His head felt incredibly sore at this point so he naturally reached towards his left temple, massaging his skull tenderly waiting for the gradual pain to subside. Where am I? He wondered disoriented. W, what the hell is going on? The last memory he could recall was a hazy mess. In truth, his entire thoughts felt like a series of broken dreams scattered across a blanket of darkness. Fragments of a past that felt somewhat too absurd to be real lingered in the forefront of his memory. Mom? Or Ringo. A father? He wondered why he had forgotten those faces. He could hear their names, but he was missing something important about them. Who was I before all of this? Who, who am I now? He mouthed strangely to himself. He faintly gathered soft murmurs to one side. Turning towards his right, he saw a group of people gawking at him with indifferent looks plastered on their faces. Who the hell are they? Not only they, but this entire place seemed strange as if he was inside some kind of cathedral. Nervously, he tilted his gaze towards the heavens to inspect things further. The ceiling was far away from him. The distant ceiling was crafted from stained glass mosaics. He held faint memories of the Victorian-style churches for some reason. He remembered seeing pictures of them, and faintly he could recall such style churches were popular around a place he knew was Europe at the time. But this certainly wasn't Europe, was it? He wondered aimlessly. This temple was filled with tall brass cedar pillars, lined with gold embroidery patterns carved against the walls, with various ivory stone statues dwelling around the spacious hall. As Shoba took in his surroundings, the true scale of the space around him slowly became apparent the more he observed. This place reeks of upper class, although it definitely gives off the feeling of some kind of cult. Shoba only hoped he hadn't forgotten things due to this strange place. Trailing his gaze slightly downwards, 
He noticed the floor underneath him was a mosaic of white and black checkered tiles that stretched across the expanse of the entire floor. More intriguing, however, was the spot where he found himself seated. Directly beneath him was a grand seven-pointed golden star. At its core, he noticed an intricate design of an azure eye embedded within an open palm. I guess my next question is a no-brainer. Why on earth am I kneeling against the GR dash? Yes, K. And here I thought you'd finally rid us all of your useless existence. A voice filled with disdain filled his ears. He trailed the origin of the voice a little ahead of him, where he met a slenderly tall and slightly elderly gent standing not so far away from where he was. Seeing the strange dress since forced the boy to arch one of his brows up. The fellow donned a slicked back full head of silken silvery strands. He was dressed in clean pale and gray robes, covered in cross-shaped patterns colored violet. What bothered him slightly was the feeling he felt staring into those half-opened eyelids. He could almost feel the disdain radiating behind those strikingly clear pupils of his. Why is he looking at me like that? Matter of fact, aren't all of these faces strange? I can't for the life of me make sense out of anything right now. He thought to himself as he took a careful look around again, this time ignoring the grandeur decor and focusing more on the many faces around him. The entire place was filled with people clothed in long colorful silk robes or very rural-styled clothing, somewhat reminding him of role-playing games. If he had to coin a name, he'd perhaps call their style, Adventurer's Clothing. Their faces ranged from shock to ridicule, to pity, and some even deep anger. There wasn't a single clue as to what was going on, but one thing was certain. He, who had very little idea about who he was, had suddenly found himself in an unknown place, surrounded by strange and unknown people. A combination for disaster. This K. Rado S-U-T-A. A voice almost thundered around him. I won't say this again. Regardless of whatever diseases you might carry, get your ass onto that altar and finish the damn awakening dash. Wait, diseases? Who is this old-timer talking about me? Diseases? No chance. Maybe there's someone else here. The boy could barely contain his deep look of bewilderment as he twisted his neck from side to side, wondering if this was a classic case of mistaken identity. His actions seemed to rile the ire of the elder even more, as he exhaled a deep breath before addressing him once more. By the order of the queen, every able child at the age of fifteen must submit themselves to the church. You are under the grace of the most benevolent sovereign. As such, you will participate in the ranking ceremony to determine your rank as an adventurer. Failure to do so will result in punishment of the highest order. So enough of your theatrics step onto the altar, or I'll break every last bone and force you on there myself. The boy frowned at what was obviously a threat, but upon noticing the silver fox-faced fellow step aside, the boy could barely hide his surprise as he saw a golden fountain with strange dancing dust orbiting around it. Whoa! Now what is that thing? His eyes sparkled with wanderlust as he instinctively rose to his staggering feet. He could tell by the hostile gazes that he was supposed to take this test. Only, what in the world was this test for? None of this made any sense to him, but he was obliged to follow through, seeing as somehow in some way, he was now wrapped up in a completely foreign custom. I mean, how bad could this so-called ceremony be? But I stand by my earlier thought, this feels quite cultish. He gingerly began to move his body with reluctance. While he unfolded his slightly aching joints, it suddenly dawned on him how awkward he felt trying to move around. He narrowed his brows slightly and decided to take a careful look at his body. He was young, younger than he remembered being. It was a strange feeling knowing that. He knew something was wrong, but how wrong that something was, he guessed he would find out. Under the scrutinizing gazes of the onlookers, he measured his steps towards this slightly ancient-styled golden fountain. Up close, he could see deep carvings of four-winged creatures wrapped around the basin. He lazily took a glance at one of them and felt a bizarre cold shiver running down the nape of his neck. The altar was propped a little higher than what he had first thought, which made sense as to why there were two beige-colored footsteps placed just below it. Once he neared the fountain, he peered inside it, and was surprised to see an odd small pool of shimmering liquid gathered. 
It wasn't exactly clear and looked rather milky with a very peculiar sparkling dust floating just above the water. Other than his initial surprise as to what this heavenly-looking water could be, he saw a foreign face staring back at him in the reflection of the silvery liquid. A round and very youthful face. Brown skin, with large wide brown eyes and a bizarre fall of bright pink braided locks. He had this unconscious feeling that his foggy memories, his new surroundings, as well as this unknown boy staring back at him in the reflection, were all part of something rather sinister that he had yet to fully understand. He gave the shrewd-faced fellow a second glance. His eyes narrowed as he was hellbent on making him do this, it seemed. Place your hand inside. The silver-haired gent urged in a stiff tone. The boy gulped down nervously before he complied and slowly hovered his right hand over the strange waters, passing his fingers through a glittering smoky haze gathered just on top of the water. A cold sensation brushed against his skin, so he lowered his hands deeper until his fingers were beginning to submerge. Seconds later, his entire right hand was resting inside this lukewarm, strange, inky pool. Okay, here goes. Please don't be demonic, please don't be demonic, please, please. He was kind of expecting something dramatic to take place. But for the first few minutes, nothing happened. The boy turned towards the man with silver hair again, his eyes almost pleading towards him expectantly. So what now? He asked the silver fox. The man started to massage his labella in response. Sigh, your mana. Transfer your mana, you idiot. The boy stood there momentarily dazed for a while. He wasn't expecting that response, and what was this transferring of mana business? Mana? Mana? He resigned to not having a single clue how to do that and shrugged his shoulders, deciding maybe if he closed his two eyes and focused intently on the word, perhaps something might happen. Five minutes of silence passed by. Ten minutes passed. Twenty-five minutes. Forty minutes passed by. And still... The boy was standing idly with his hands submerged in this strange lukewarm water like an idiot. He heard disgruntled groans and murmurs starting to fester from the crowd. The heckles arrived along with boos and chants. The fellow with silver hair had also screamed at him repeatedly to channel his mana into his hands. Puffed, as if all that screaming was going to solve anything the boy thought to himself. The boy still hadn't the foggiest idea what this mana thing was about. The underlying truth of the whole matter was that despite his very scarce memories, he had no idea where he was right now, nor could he remember anything about the past, where he came from, who he was exactly, and what he was doing here. It also didn't help that these people were growing increasingly restless by the sounds of things. Their groans and disgruntled whispers had gradually evolved into vocal jeers at this point. It was somewhat uncomfortable, hearing so many people screaming obscenities towards him at once. The boy sort of felt a deep swelling anger growing after a while, especially where he had no recollection of any wrongdoing. So why in the world were they hellbent on making this difficult for him? Those rude little, sigh, let me calm down. It's not like I want to be standing here, but somehow I'm supposed to do something? Mana? What in the world is that? With the atmosphere growing more tense with every passing second, he remained standing in this awkward position, and by now his hand had almost completely wrinkled from the prolonged time he had it submerged in this pool of water. The fellow with silver hair standing idly to one side finally moved, but how he actually moved completely startled the boy first and foremost. The boy could have sworn he blinked and saw a shadow blur in his direction. Before he had a second to process anything, the man reappeared behind him, placing a firm hand against his left shoulder. Frightened was an understatement. He felt his body go completely numb as though ice ran through his very bones. But a few moments later, he realized something was off. He couldn't move a single inch of his body. Boy, you've wasted enough of everyone's time. Now what I'm about to do is considered somewhat iniquitous. But on this occasion, you've left me with no choice. Try not to move too much. Once those words left the silver fox's mouth, the boy felt a sharp pain shooting through his shoulders. It felt like a knife being dug between his shoulder blades before being twisted and plunged deeper. Then arrived a burning sensation like no other, and he felt his entire back scorching with fire as though a piece of the sun had been dropped on top of him. 
Just when the boy was almost assured he would be losing consciousness fairly quickly, he heard an echo in his thoughts. At first, it sounded like a whisper, but it changed into a slightly audible voice. Then it flowed through his mind like a gentle song. As it was, and so it shall always be, my dearest one, for all things in the same way they started, foretold to us by the ones who both saw and knew the beginning and the end. Just in case we are shrouded in doubt, let this lament breathe life into your bones. May your second song be the very first one, a life filled with an abundance of adventures and love. As for this one, let it fade into a distant memory, forevermore. Suddenly a plethora of memories cascaded into his mind. Her sweet-tasting words were like a thorny rose coiled around the boy's heart, squeezing the fleshy heart with each passing breath. Darkness invaded from the corners of his eyes. The white light softly faded, breathless and waiting. Fragile he was, tucked beneath her warm and familiar bosom, but still fading into a hazy black smoke. Her soft brown hands wrapped tightly around his little neck. He couldn't see her entire face, for the world was too bright to see. But her smile was loving, distorted but filled with a motherly love. Her bountiful wild hair, a cascading tuft of electric pink with shades of violet. The darkness arrived forcefully, her hands still wrapped around his little neck, tightening. Her cherry rose smile creased into a cruel smirk, the mask of a deranged clown, crowned in madness. Beneath her forceful stranglehold, the boy made no sounds whilst he sunk into a cold, painless silence. The darkness settled in silence swept through his thoughts. Hello. His voice echoed through the thick darkness he suddenly found himself inside of. Where is this place, and why can't I see a single thing? Outside of his voice, the boy suddenly captured a unique sound stirring his attention suddenly. He heard the sounds of a matchstick being struck, and then much to his horror, he saw a series of eerie green flames igniting along a runway formation. His mind recalled an altar, but he was wrong. At the end of the green fires, he saw a throne made out of stones and bones. His heart trembled once he noticed that. Something stirred a great need to flee the moment he saw that grotesque-looking throne. Damn it! Did I die? Is this gulp, H.L.? A violet carpet unfurled down the aisle between the crackling emerald fires, with strange golden symbols slowly appearing like dust. Seeing this, he wasted no time. He felt his feet unconsciously taking hurried steps back. Hey, mister! Have you come to wake up the sleeping princess too? A childlike voice startled him and he jumped around in a flash to meet the sudden arrival of a gentle voice. His gaze trailed down suspiciously as he met a tiny, pale-skinned girl standing in his clear view. Their eyes met and the boy flinched upon instinct, noticing her bright round crimson eyes, innocently beholding him with a strange, riveting glow to them. Her round, childlike face matched her tiny frame, and she was dressed in a modest gothic black dress with knee-high socks, but strangely no shoes. W.H. Who the hell is this, and where did she? No more importantly, where the hell am I right now? None of this makes any sense. While his thoughts were in turmoil, the little girl blinked innocently, staring at him with those hard-to-read yet remarkable glittering carmine irises. After minutes of awkward silence, she finally parted her little mouth again. Mister, you don't seem like a bad man, but little Cell can't let you stay here yet. She... She will be angry at me if she finds out I spoke to a Stwainager. Her cute face turned crestfallen. Is she trying to say stranger? And Cell? What kind of name is Cell? A strange name for a strange kid, I guess. But more concerningly, am I dead or not? And if I am dead, what the hell is this child doing here? Who is this she that will be angry at you? The boy asked, slightly concerned about her sudden appearance, but realizing angering her might be a big mistake if he was dead and this was a manifestation of some monster. Oh? W.E. Well, Cell must not say. B. But she is in charge. She's sleeping right now because of the bad men. She she wasted a lot of her power to defeat them. So she's been sleeping, mister. She's been asleep for a very, 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 very long time. The girl said, twisting her toes against the formless ground shyly. Yeah, that is a lot of varies. Also, why am I getting this strange feeling I'm missing something here? But soon she'll wake up, and sometimes she's mean to sell a mister. 
saw thee. SL has said too much. I have. I have to go now. Be by, mister. I hope we can meet again someday. Hey, hey. Wait. What do you mean? What is this place, Cell? Right? Listen. I need your help. My name is... Well, you can call me Mr. And I have to find a way back. Also, am I dead? Is this hell? Who do I talk to about a second chance? I'm sorry. Mr. Cell has to go now. Bye for now and good lucks. The boy expected her to scurry off back into the depths she appeared from. But instead... He stood aimlessly and watched her slowly dissipate into nothing. He was completely left in horror, taking a few steps back unconsciously, but then felt he something weird happening to him. He heard a voice again, one that filled his heart with a surprising joyous song this time. My dear, it isn't safe for you to be here. For now, allow the sweet dreams of illusions to sink deep again. In time, you will remember again. Seek my resting place. On the hill beneath the oldest oak tree. There, the veil shall fall. But be prepared for what you will discover might break your heart all over again. Let thy peace be with you, dear child, forevermore. T that voice, why do I know that voice? H.A. Strange Ghost, where are you? What's going on? What am I doing here? And where's that weird kid gone? Hey, answer me. Hey. He looked at his body and realized he too was going through the same thing. Damn it, this is getting ridiculous. But he was powerless to stop it. He felt that familiar feeling of darkness quickly invading his vision. Before he fell into that familiar state of emptiness again, he hoped this wasn't what death felt like, as the whole process felt very deathly if you asked him. Chapter 18, 18. The Rankings Amongst the Faithful. Suda POV. The boy was grateful that his incapacitated state seemed to be short-lived. He soon became aware of various sounds breaking through the surrounding silence. Muffled voices and exclamations filled the air alongside a breath of golden white light clouding his vision. Yo! Oh! How can… How could you do that? He heard someone yell. He's just a child. You might have killed him, you villain. How dare you? I… I am acting on the direct orders of Her Majesty to ensure. Ah, the silver fox is being told of. E, good, good. I only wish I wasn't too groggy to see it. Cut the crap. You villain. A childish voice spoke. So, our esteemed queen is now in the business of murdering children, is she? Another woman said. You members of the church are all the same. Bunch of scoundrels. You're as despicable as those demons. You, you, wait. Is he? Is he coming too? As the boy's vision gradually cleared. He was surprised to find himself lying on his back, gazing up at a distant ceiling with no memory of how he had arrived there. I really hope this isn't the norm with me. All this fainting can't be good for my health. He vaguely remembered feeling an unfamiliar force overwhelming him. And slowly whilst clarity returned, he was beginning to feel somewhat annoyed this airiness was beginning to become a constant reality. Did that old man poison me? Yes, K. I'm only a child. Who the hell goes around poisoning kids for? He gruntled inside, still feeling quite weak to even talk it seemed. Upon regaining consciousness, he captured two new faces around him, their faces clearly a mask of annoyance. Apart from that cunning silver fox, two new faces stood around him, their gazes softer, whilst the younger of the two had tears welled in her almond-shaped eyes. He also noticed their similar appearances, shared by their tan skin and curly reddish-brown hair, which led the boy to sense a familial connection between them. The younger of the two, in particular, with her green eyes and dark freckles, seemed quite relieved once she noticed him regaining consciousness. While he was momentarily curious about these strangers, his attention was soon captivated by a more bizarre sight taking place behind the trio. What in the world is that ugly thing? Am I still dreaming? Floating behind them were three conjoined ghoulish heads covered in a swash of gold. Out of the three, only the middle head held its terrifying eyes wide open, staring into an empty space against the air. When it finally spoke, it revealed a mouth full of white teeth and an odd purple tongue. Its face twisted in pain, and its eyes started to rattle as though it was having a seizure. Someone put that thing out of its misery, dearie me. He could see the strange thing's mouth contorting, 
presenting a surreal scene to the bewildered boy as it tried to force words out from its hideous maw. As he watched on in anticipation, he noticed the other two heads slowly opening their eyelids. And then, a deafening sound broke the silent air, followed by a haughty voice speaking from the middle head. Talent received, rank E. The golden totems declared with a voice that resonated like thunder. Rank E. Why does that feel kinda low? His mood sunk a little hearing that. He couldn't put a finger on why. But surely there were better letters than that he imagined. His daydream was quickly disturbed by the resounding murmurs from the nearby crowd, their expressions shifting into a mixture of surprise and amusement, especially among the younger onlookers, who he noticed standing by one side of the cathedral. The youths in this corner were the ones clothed in adventurer garbs and some in silks. Bwahaha, can you believe it? After all that, he's only an E-rank? What a joke, laughed one of the youths amongst the crowd. He narrowed his gaze towards this youth in particular, who looked every bit of the type of boy who would make such a comment. He carried neatly cropped blonde hair, piercing bright green eyes, and symmetrical features giving him the air of a boy band member, albeit one with an unmistakable arrogance. Hmm, he has a face I want to punch, but probably best I ignore it. Erg, why is my body so weak? Feeling the weight of humiliation, he refused to remain seated against the ground, and with little effort, began to carry himself upright. His body was still sore and his head was throbbing, slowing his movements. Let me assist you, offered a woman with a mature visage, extending a hand with a compassionate smile affixed against her slightly aged features. The boy noticed her eyes reflecting pity and yet an unmistakable show of warmth as she watched his every movement until he could move fairly properly on his own. He glanced at the silver-haired man again, who seemed exasperated, pinching the bridge of his nose and shaking his head in disapproval. Waste of time, bloody waste of time. He heard the silver fox muttering. Surveying the hall, he noted the mixed reactions of the crowd. Some jeered. Others urged him to vacate the ceremonial space at once. Whilst others simply couldn't care less. Was my rank that bad? I mean, he does seem somewhat low, but what's the big deal anyway? Maybe I was right, and this place is some kind of cult. His body tensed up a little whilst he thought about those odds. If he was somehow involved in some sort of demonic ritual, perhaps the low rank might be a blessing in disguise. Susuda, we must go, whispered a voice tinged with worry beside him. Huh, Suda? Who the hell is that? He asked himself, turning slightly towards his right side. His gaze met the concerned green eyes of a girl with reddish-brown curls. Her smile was gentle, but he could still see looks of worry against her childish features. She was also holding onto his arm quite tightly as well. Within that moment, he felt a strange feeling, an inexplicable pang of surprise and sorrow within his chest as if he should recognize her, yet her name escaped him. More importantly, that name? Suta. Didn't that grumpy silver fox call me that as well? Which means, I guess, my name is Suda. Speaking of that fellow, it was his distinctive voice that caught his attention once more as he turned slightly to face him. The golem has made its decree. The silver-haired man interrupted the loud murmurs, his voice cutting through to silence the crowd. Irank. The boy is unqualified. Return to your place. He sneered with disdain towards him. Despite the sting of those words, the boy wasn't that saddened by it. How could he in truth? He held no recollection of anything. Suda felt a gentle tug against his arm from the girl beside him. With a resigned sigh, he allowed her to lead him away, stepping gingerly beside her as they navigated past the sea of mocking faces. As they made their way to one side of the grand hall, Suda couldn't help but admire the marble flooring beneath their feet. Despite the disappointment of the awakening ceremony, the splendor of the surroundings caught his attention making him muse about the opulence of the place akin to a king's residence slash, which again steered his mind into a small wonder. I can remember things such as Europe, African kings and queens, and the Asian dynasties, ancient history, wars, and slavery. Those memories certainly don't feel like they belong to this world. And yet, I know they to be true. Damn it, what's actually going on here? Why do things feel out of place in my head?
And what about that strange little girl with red eyes? Sigh, this is quite the ordeal. Whilst he remained locked in his thoughts concerning the changes around him, he passed by a towering statue of a goddess crafted from grey stone. Suda noticed one of these when he first awoke here. Only now did he have the opportunity to admire one up close. The goddess carried an open book in one hand, and a bowl that seemed to contain snakes in the other. But most strikingly, two blood-red eyes that glittered like rubies, starkly contrasting with the rest of the statue's grey stone composition. The statue's demonic aura, emphasized by those haunting eyes, stirred an unsettling feeling within him. Hey, that's a goddess? She looks more like a devil. He swallowed harshly whilst he tried to busy his eyes elsewhere. Chapter 19 19 The Rankings Amongst the Faithful 2 Suda POV Reaching a quieter section of the hall, Suda and the girl found themselves among individuals whose appearances and demeanor seemed markedly less refined than those in the rest of the hall. Their expressions for starters were largely vacant and devoid of life in stark contrast to the more elegant and lively crowd elsewhere, who were noisy and quick to throw insults. Spoilt little brats. Suda could handle the chorus of boos and heckling, but above all, fear gripped him tightly as he came to understand more than one glaring truth about all of this. This world was not his own, and it perplexed him deeply that after awakening again, forgotten memories of another world began to resurface with increasing clarity. In those memories, he had a mother, a father, even a sister, but why didn't he feel it? Their names rested on the tip of his tongue, but his mind could not form pictures or feelings toward them. Something had been taken from him. Frustration gnawed at him as he grappled with the strange disconnection he felt. Something inexplicable was happening to him, and he couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered within. It's all right, Suta. Briala reassured him, noticing the strangeness in his eye movements. It doesn't matter if you're considered a low rank. W, we don't need the kingdom. We, we can become adventurers on our own. Suda observed her cute round face puffing up with resolve. A warm smile creased against his own. Something about her determination warmed his heart. Teach thanks. He replied earnestly. At least I have one person here who doesn't hate me. It was a familiar feeling one that prompted him to instinctively rub the side of her head gently, eliciting an adorable cooing sound from her in response. Briala, Briala, approached the goddess's altar. A sharp voice interrupted their moment of affection, causing the small girl's frame to tense up whilst her eyes widened in fear. Oh no, it sits my turn, she stammered. So that's her name, Briala. As he glanced towards the center of the altar, Catching the eyes of the shrewd, silver-haired man again, he swiftly placed his hands on Briala's shoulders and met her gaze directly before she made her way. Don't be afraid, okay? The more fear you show, the more they'll think you care about what they think. Remember, whatever happens, it's good enough. All right? Suda offered a reassuring smile, though internally feeling awkward. He had no real feelings towards the girl but he couldn't ignore the familiarity and fear he sensed. Briala's large eyes filled with life as her tan cheeks turned slightly pink, with a dazzling smile lighting up against her features before a playful chuckle escaped her lips. Idiot Suta, since when were you so good with your words? Hee hee, teach thank you. I needed that, she said, balling her hands into tiny fists before lightly prodding his chest. Wait for me. She added before straightening her shabby clothes and walking towards the altar. Along the way, the crowd gathered from the other side began whispering and making snide comments about the girl. Eventually, Briala arrived by that accursed looking fountain, holding one of her dainty hands out before delicately lowering it into the water. With a deep breath, she firmly closed her eyes. Unlike Suda's performance, hers seemed to be moving expectedly. Swiftly, Suda observed the three-headed golden golem gently rise out from the waters, a dazzling white light brightly shining from their gaping mouths. Two of the heads, just like before, shut their eyes, but then one of them flashed its eyes open. Now there were two heads with both of their eyes open. Talent received. A rank. The announcement brought a chilling silence sweeping through the altar. A rank? Huh? Suda thought. I guess that should mean she's good, right? He quickly searched for answers among the faces around. 
The silver-haired fellow looked completely gobsmacked, and the crowd around him shared his sentiments, it seems. Impossible! Someone from the other side of the cathedral exclaimed aloud. How can a commoner have such high talent? Another protested. Do it again. Maybe it was a mistake. Er, why is he staring at me like that? The silver fox, dressed in nice robes, stared daggers directly toward those youths who couldn't keep their mouths shut. Meanwhile, Briala merely stood by the altar, unsure of what to do next, alternating between staring at her dainty hand cutely and taking in different looks at the fountain with slightly furrowed brows. The scene was quite cute from where Suda was standing. Well, well so the little one is talented, I guess that makes one of us. He felt perhaps he should join her and tell her good job, but just when his body was poised to move, he saw that mature-faced woman from before racing to Briala's side. She wrapped her arms around the girl and held her tightly in one full swoop. Thank the goddess. Your talent. Amazing. My daughter. Amazing. I'm so proud. She held Briala's face between her two hands, tears of joy streaming down her cheeks. Briala looked visibly confused, slightly alarmed, but more so irritated. Her eyes finally landed in Suda's direction, and he saw a wave of happiness suddenly bloom from her freckled cheeks. She rather rudely pried herself free and began to walk back towards him with a high raised chin, only to have her body held in place by the stern arm of the silver haired fellow again. Adat, you are eligible for direct training beneath one of Her Majesty's famous top guilds. You will be taken to the capital tonight to continue your training. Your family will be taken care of and receive a substantial amount of payment whilst you're away. The man spoke with a seemingly warm smile. Heh, so all of a sudden he knows how to form warm smiles now. Eh, typical. Suda snorted, observing Briala's skepticism mirrored in her furrowed brows as well. Let me go, you old man. I'm going to Suda. Imam, tell him to unhand me? Briala demanded. It's all right, my dear. Listen, these are the rules of the kingdom. If you're deemed as having enough talent, you'll be taken to the capital to train. It's a great opportunity that many kids won't be able to, the woman tried to explain to deaf and defiant ears. Who cares about that stuff? Oh, let me go, you scoundrel. Briala snapped, her eyes scanning the hall until they finally landed on Suda's own again. S-U-D-A. H, help me. They're trying to take me away. They're trying to split U.S. apart, S-U-T-A. Briala's cry suddenly put Suda back into the firing line, feeling all eyes lock onto his position instantly made him tense up. On one hand, he felt genuine warmth towards the girl's bashfulness, especially where he could see it was mainly because of him. But on the other hand, he needed her to stop bringing so much attention to him. Sigh. Why is she making it look like we're long-lost lovers? She continued to refuse to obey anyone, her scowl deepening as Suda watched the situation escalate with each passing minute. Something about this scene stirred an uncomfortable feeling inside of him. He felt tethered to protecting something, though he couldn't quite place what it was. As Briala continued to scream his name, Suda finally decided to take action. He took a step forward, unsure how he was going to save her from their clutches. Suddenly, he felt something cold travel through his entire body. Then, he heard something as clear as day close to his ears. Suda, right? This is Priestess Claudia. Don't be alarmed. I am Briala's mother, the one who helped you. Suda's shaking eyes immediately moved towards the woman crouched beside Briala by the altar. He felt strange seeing her worried gaze focused on him. Though her mouth was clearly shut, he could hear her words flowing into his ears. And that question floated through his thoughts once again. Where the hell was he right now? Suda, I need your help. Briala must obey me. This is the only way she can save herself. She doesn't understand it yet, but there is no other way she can go back to the life she used to live with you. Please, Suda, if you truly care about my daughter, please tell her to go. Please, as her mother, this is the only thing I can do for her. A single tear gently rolled down Priestess Claudia's left eye. She looked genuinely in pain about the whole matter, and though Suda had no idea what had transpired between the two, it was evident their relationship wasn't simple. Slowly piecing together what possibly was going on, he realized that meant he and Briala were closer. It was becoming frustrating not knowing anything. 
Yet feeling these emotions during random situations like this one, he knew he shouldn't agree to it. But looking at the situation objectively, why shouldn't Briala go? Ranka sounded a lot better than Rank E, especially where the E rank he was given sent everyone into hysterics. Perhaps Briala was destined for an easier life than his own. With little understanding about this place, but knowing Briala recognized him, it meant either he had forgotten everything up until this point, or this body wasn't his own. But that girl, the more he looked at her, the more she reminded him of someone. Sigh. Why is nothing ever easy? I'm already forced to make decisions I don't really have confidence in making. Exhaling a warm breath, Suda rubbed his temple gently for a few moments, untangling the knots in his head, before steadily opening his mouth. Chapter 2020 The Goddess and the S Rank Suda POV Bri Briala His youthful voice slightly carried across the hall. Time seemed to stop once Suda finally said her name out loud. He felt numerous eyes quickly converging towards him. Naturally, he felt slightly embarrassed placing himself at the center of the stage again. I'll listen to them. You should go and become strong. I, I promise I will be all right okay as so go. Go and become strong. All right? He said those words without any true reasoning behind them, merely saying what he felt she needed to hear right now. That's the best I got, kid. It's not like I could offer you anything else but kind words at this point anyway. He held her gaze for a short while in silence, and she held his. A gentle smile tugged at the corners of her mouth, filling Suda with some kind of relief. But then almost suddenly, her eyes looked surprised for some moments as she pondered something, and then disappointment surfaced. Suda didn't miss a single change. His brows slightly narrowed as he watched her face become crestfallen. Briala shook away the hold from her shoulders finally, but she stopped protesting and simply stood there, watching her feet. Yo you too, Suda? You don't want me around as well? She muttered. He clearly heard her words, but he was still unsure if he was hearing her correctly, trying to refocus on his previous statement, wondering where such a thing was implied. She lifted her head, her eyes glazed with tears as she stared right into his own gaze wearing a mocking smile towards him. One which instantly pulled at his heartstrings, she opened her delicate mouth and spoke. Fine. I'll leave you alone then. SSD stu stupid weak Suda. Brilia screamed before turning on her heels and stomping away. Oos and Oss echoed through the halls. Ouch. That one hurt. Well, guess that's an extra person who hates me then. Sigh. How troublesome. Everything is just so troublesome indeed. After watching Briala storm away down the aisle of the cathedral, Suda was a little lost with what to do with himself now. Somehow despite his best wishes, this entire ordeal had turned him into the center of all things negative. He could still hear constant sniggering coming from among the onlookers, obviously directed towards him. Suda tried to ignore the outside noise, instead, his gaze just so happened to fall towards the mature-faced lady. He saw relief wash away the anxiety previously against her face and also a similar kind against the shrewd-faced silver fox. But why did it feel as though he had lost again? Perhaps he should have told her to stay? Erg, why do I feel terrible all of a sudden? It's not like I even remember half of the time spent with that girl. Plus I was only trying to look out for her, humph. A lesson learnt for next time, I guess. He shook his head slightly whilst he creased a sardonic smile wondering who else he might end up offending at this rate. The awakening ceremony continued very much the same way it started, of course barring his awkward encounter. More and more young faces took to the altar, placed their hands into the fountain, and heard their ranks from those grotesque-looking heads loudly announcing it. During the course of the fast-moving ceremony, Suda heard countless C-ranks, a few B-ranks, and one or two more ranks announced after Briala, but not many. It wasn't until a small number of youths remained that he soon realized how swiftly this should have all been. Shaking his head at the time he alone spent at that altar, it was no wonder everyone was throwing curses at him for wasting time. Finally, only four people were left, one of whom was the blonde-haired boy from before. He swaggered toward the altar with measured steps, exuding an air of confidence around him. Just before he reached the altar, he bizarrely gave Suda a snide smirk and mouthed something strange. I'll take care of her, 
Suda was assured he read his lips, and then he winked at him before continuing along. This little boy clearly has some screws loose. How typical. The poster boy has an issue with me. What kind of clique story have I walked into? Suda didn't react, of course, and simply observed quietly from where he stood. By now he had grown so tired of this spectacle that he was almost falling asleep while standing. He performed the same actions as everyone else, placing his hand into the fountain before waiting for the expected rise of the three-headed golems. A shimmering golden light danced across the still water in response. The three ugly heads rose again, but then something strange took place. From what he had observed about them, only two of the three heads ever kept their eyes open. However, this time around, he saw all three heads with their eyes glued open. Their looks of distress were difficult to observe, but not just for him. Everyone still present felt something intense about to happen. The goddess has chosen. The goddess has chosen. The goddess has chosen. The floating heads all began roaring the same words in unison. Their voices were as sharp as blades, forcing him to shield his ears out of fear of his eardrums being ruptured. He tried to keep his rattling eyes glued to the altar, almost having to blink several times to make sure he wasn't dreaming. What in the world is that? A blinding pale light shone dangerously ahead. He wouldn't dare to open his eyes right now, forced into narrowing his gaze whilst purposely shielding his eyes using his arm. Other people seemed too slow to catch on, and he heard a range of screams of panic and terror nearby. Arg! My eyes! My eyes! I can't see! Someone help me! W! What the hell is that thing? It's too bright I can't! I can't see! As the overwhelming brightness gradually faded, Suda cautiously lowered his arm, his eyes narrowing in disbelief unsure whether or not he was seeing clearly. What met his gaze, however, was beyond anything he could have anticipated. There, above the fountain, floated a figure so majestic and ethereal it seemed as though she belonged to another realm. Her skin was a smooth, angelic gray, and she hovered just above the water's surface, her form gracefully arching towards the sky. Adorned in pale, silvery attire that sparkled with golden light, she exuded any form of elegance. From her back unfurled the most exquisite pair of pale wings, noticeably causing Suda's mouth to slacken with surprise. Her long, luxurious white hair cascaded down to her feet, adding to her divine presence. The world seemed to stand still around him, and then his gaze locked onto her eyes, sparkling red jewels that contrasted starkly with her serene outward appearance. Framing her face were two ram-like ivory horns. In a moment of clarity, as if struck by lightning, Suda's mind raced to the statues scattered throughout the hall. It dawned on him darkly at that very moment. It's her. She's. The goddess? Apart from himself, Suda saw everyone within the cathedral falling against a single knee. He stood hesitant for a short while, being the only one standing at this moment, but ultimately he decided against kneeling. Something within him was acting against the thought of doing that, a strange feeling of disgust almost. Instead, he took a few cautious steps back, slightly placing himself behind one of the gray stone statues that resembled her. Greetings, my loyal followers. Her voice flowed like choral music, and yet Suda felt a sense of deep anguish soothing over his bones while he heard her. She cast a gaze around the entire hall. Whilst her eyes passed over his direction, his chest felt a rush of anxiety again. There was a brief pause in her movements, but he made sure he was half hidden behind the statue, unable to be truly seen. Luckily his actions didn't appear to have gotten him noticed as the goddess passed over him without a care in the world. She then lowered her gaze downwards to those knelt by the fountain before her. Greetings, my champion. You have been marked by destiny. She spoke. Her sweet smile sent a shiver running down his spine. Your talents have been acknowledged, Estran, as you are deemed as possessing an S rank. And so, it is I, the goddess of dawn and gold, who holds all the dreams of those loyal on the tip of my left hand. And as such, I shall grant you a portion of my grace. Make it a single wish. Let it be known to me, so that I may make it true as a show of our newly found accord. A gentle gasp moved across the hall, and even Suda himself couldn't hold back his genuine deep surprise after hearing all of that. 
A W wish? What kind of insane power does she have? Does that mean that arrogant guy could wish for anything he wanted, and then it would be granted? Suda swallowed harshly, watching on with agonizing anticipation as this almost baffling scene unfolded. He watched with a distressing glare, eagerly locked onto the pompous youth as the fellow rubbed his chin for a short while in deep thought. He failed to capture what was said, but he did notice a slight change in the expressionless gaze of the goddess once she heard Estrin's answer. The youth said a few words before turning back towards him, wearing a mischievous grin plastered against his obnoxious face. Suda's heart sank almost instantly, dreading to wonder what the youth had wished for. But the goddess seemed conflicted with something. Even an ethereal figure like herself was displaying what Suda would call human emotions, which struck him as odd. After a short pause, the goddess noticeably shook her head from side to side, her ruby glowing eyes filling with deep wonder. Suda wasn't exactly sure why, but her presence filled him with emotions closer to hatred rather than hope, harmony, and reverence. Something is definitely wrong with me, Suda mused to himself massaging his temple a little. His body had become a contained for all things strange and less wonderful. The goddess raised her slender, pale arm, pure and smooth like a jade crystal. Her fingers danced across the empty air, performing a series of delicate hand seals, before conjuring an almost blinding ball of light against her palm. Most of those present shielded their gazes, but Suda fought against his body's instincts, feeling a weird obsession not to even blink. The goddess reached downwards and placed the golden light on top of Estrin's head. A bizarre thing took place as the shimmering golden ball began to enter through his skull. Narrowing his gaze, he saw this golden, thick liquid substance slowly wrapping itself all over Estrin's body. Moments passed before the golden essence finally dissipated. Rubbing his itchy eyes, Suda was a little surprised to see the goddess's once brilliant light quickly fading into a shimmering afterimage. I hope my gift aids you well, my champion. Her fading smoky voice trailed throughout the hall, and Suda felt the tiny hairs along his arms stand up. That was too weird. A goddess? W.H. What kind of world is this? He darkly asked himself, and why am I so on guard? It's like something inside of me is naturally opposing her. Damn it, am I the demonic one? He asked himself. Amidst his uncertainty regarding just about everything, he noticed the boy called Estran was swiftly surrounded by a group of mature-faced fellows. They were dressed in expensive-looking pale silks, with heavy white robes slung over their shoulders, bearing a large gold X stitched against their backs. They reminded Suda of priests. Putting all those thoughts aside, that lucky individual was an S rank. Despite not having a single clue about the ranking system, it didn't take a genius to understand that rank was exceptionally high, so high that it invoked the arrival of a goddess. That lucky bastard, of course, the one who suddenly hates me gets an OP ability like that. Just remembering those carmine eyes again filled him with a strange sense of terror. There were so many changes within him and around him that he felt he just needed a few hours to simply calm down, in order to carefully piece together these fractured memories. By now, the entire hall had turned into the Estran show. They swooned around him like dogs, showering him with countless offers underneath the sun. He even heard a few ask him whether or not he was interested in marrying some of their daughters. The pompous-looking blonde couldn't get enough of it. Now and then, he stole a mocking glance his way, but Suda ignored his taunts. He had his own worries to deal with. Attention! A rough voice erupted his thinking. Suda's lazy gaze moved towards the source of the noise in haste. An average-sized man stood by the front of the large gathering of people he happened to be part of. He was clothed in leather over a warm-colored tunic and beige trousers with hunting boots. A dark dandy mustache warmed the top of his lips, and just from an initial glance, he could tell the man held no pleasure in talking to any of them. Listen, as none of yous have been deemed worthy enough to be granted tutelage from the queen, I'm afraid to say your chance as becoming students beneath one of the queen's most famous guilds has come to an end. If you kindly exit in a single file, we've already arranged your carriages back to Hobbleton. Oh right, and since we've possibly deprived you of a day's work, you'll all receive a small payment as a gesture of goodwill. Good day, and I wish you all the best of luck.